Um, you guys have missed it because we had a lot of off record, uh, off air conversation about the horrors of stand up. Michael McDonald, the great Michael McDonald, um, Mad TV alum, and uh, now director, producer, writer, millionaire. Millionaire. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for keeping it only as a single digit millionaire. That's right. And, and with piercing blue eyes. I don't know if you've seen Michael in person, but he's got piercing blue eyes. I, you know, I didn't tell you that you were going to be co-hosting. No, you didn't. No, and so that's I, what you're doing. You're co-hosting the fighter and the kid. I mostly thought mm-hmm. I just, I knew I'd just be doing a lot of listening. <laughs> well, I, well, I, I, I'm going to let you talk a lot, but I will say that <laughs> you are the celebrity, or you know, certainly the Mad TV alum. I'm, I'm confused for the most. Really? Uh huh. So. If one more person says, I loved you as Stuart on Mad TV, and I, and by the way, I have never denied it. I've always said thank you. Uh, that happens to me with Will Ferrell, and I always <laughs> accept it. And I'm not joking. <laughs> really? Yeah, I think I do the cheerleader. One time in the middle of my stand up show in West Palm Beach, Florida, <laughs> sure. 45 minutes into the show, I'm actually like rap, practically wrapping the show up, and I talk about, you know, who I am in yeah. my own stand-up show. Yeah. And there was a little lull in the conversation, and that's when people like to yell out or whatever. And a girl said, do the cheerleaders. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe it. In my own stand-up show, 45 minutes in, I, I would have did not it. know who I was. I just would have done it. I uh, almost broke down to tears. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're kind of glad not to be doing stand-up. Yeah, everybody's glad not to be doing it. Well, When they, I mean... Nobody really loves it. I know that yeah, people say I they love it. <laughs> I, I, well, I think what you're talking about is like the, the performance is great, but the travel, the the, the sort of the you're club alone. managers, you know, who are like, hey, I'm not trying to nickel and dime you, but <laughs> how about you stay in this hostel? <laughs> <laughs> well, one time I, I was in Tennessee and I was doing a club and I get into my condo and <clears throat> I'm kind of unpacking and I I know which just club this around was. and yep and <laughs> I yep and uh, I a guy walks out of the other room and I go I'm a grown man am I sharing this with you sir oh was was that and person... it was back when I was young enough so I did not even young enough but I just I I'm not a diva I don't care enough I, I I'm not going to make a scene I should be you I would imagine wouldn't be having it. And, and I wouldn't right have that, to. but I would. I wouldn't. I wouldn't throw a fit and like not do a show. I would just quietly go get a hotel room, and yes. I wouldn't. It wouldn't even matter to me if yeah. it cost me. Like That's I right. wouldn't care because that to me is the ultimate. I have to have a nice hotel or a nice place to at least burrow into to while I cry and drink over the <laughs> life that I'm living. Well, that, this one, so, so, so let me ask you this. For me, when I'm on the road, so when I'm doing long weekends, right? if I'm doing like some Thursday to Saturday, Thursday to Sunday, You'll do it, that. Used to, it used to be Thursday to Sunday. I don't You'll do, do it that. anymore. Oh, man. No, I used to. I can't. The key to me was quickly, as quickly as I could, just do Friday, Saturday, and that's it. Yes. Now, here's the thing. I would do, I'd get in Wednesday. I would to leave on something. Monday. Oh. Okay? I, I, I used to do that. Now, the problem with that is that Look, for anybody out there who has a job they hate when we're complaining about being comics, do, yeah, but do like, hear me out. You people in the Middle East, I know you think you've got it bad. <laughs> I know you Syrian refugees <laughs> think it's bad. So so this is all in context, but this is what I mean to say. The amount of time that you spend alone mm-hmm. in your hotel room and then walking and then you eat, but you're not really talking to anybody. So you're very isolated all day, and then you go and do this. You have this experience where, again, you're alone on stage. You're getting tremendous uh, energy, yep. and then you go from there to um, isolation. You again. take pictures, I guess. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. People don't buy your DVDs, right? They, they and again, we were talking about. I used to sell merch where I'd stand out behind a table. I did it approximately three times because I just. I couldn't. You're I, like a circus sh- freak sure in a sh- cage. Sure's sh- twenty bucks if you buy the CD. Sure's thirty five dollars. I can't. I, oh, how much more do I make? Two, two grand? Three grand? Ten grand? I, I don't care. Because it would make me it. more depressed. Right. Yeah. Then what happens is you get married. So used to, when I was younger, I'd at least try to find a girl that I could spend like a Drinking night get with. laid. I was so depressed that I had to just, I just wanted that human contact, right? right? Anyway, the point is that th- then you get married and that becomes more complicated because, you know, your wife will get mad if you're cheating on her. <laughs> so so there's all kinds of issues like that. So you really do spend so much of your time alone, right? Mm-hmm. 
Or, and the other thing is if you have just like a, a low level of being known as a, I, I would say I have a very, very low level, but just enough yes. that people feel comfortable to, when if you do go out during the day, yeah. uh, to have to take pictures while you're eating alone. <laughs> when you're eating alone at IHOP and they know you as that guy, yeah. and then they, you're kind of a celebrity, but not really, but you're eating alone at IHOP but you'll do at because, in the morning. Yeah, you're, you're not really a celebrity, but you'll do because this is the best they can do. You're a prop. <laughs> the you're, best they can do in you know Alabama or whatever. You're a touchstone to their past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're that guy or, who does that character. I, my mom loves you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how you know you're getting older. Yeah. That yeah. and my, uh, looking in the mirror. One time I, I was lonely enough to be dragged to a frat house. And I looked around <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm, I'm 38 and these kids are 18. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm kind of the center of attention. And one kid was going through my phone to see if there were any celebrities uh-huh. that he would recognize. <laughs> and I was just like, this, th- I might kill myself right now. But I'm too pathetic to leave. <laughs> I kind of want to stay a little longer. Mm-hmm. And then I, I, I had to get the fuck out of there. I can remember <clears throat> getting high in the back seat of a Toyota Corolla of the one of the waitresses and a busboy so of the club so in Cleveland in the parking oh structure, God. and we ha- <laughs> we rolled down the windows, you know, to let the smoke out, but we didn't roll them down very low because it was fucking freezing. Sure, in Cleveland yeah. in the winter, which is when I booked it. That's yeah, and I that's when that. I remember getting high and thinking, "What am I doing?" <laughs> That's why Buffalo, when they go, you want to do Buffalo in January, f- fuck you. I don't, I say. I don't, I don't say, Buffalo I don't say no. in spring. Go, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, when I did a club in Buffalo, there was a fight that broke out in the middle of my act uh, and a, a like, full on fist fight with tables flying. And they wouldn't. I was like, should we stop the show? And the, and the owner got on the back mic. He's like, nope, nope, we're going to take care of it. Whoa, 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 hey. And they just let the fight happen. Like a hockey brawl. Yeah. And then eventually it cleared out, and I continued on with my set as if it's the good thing I grew up in an Irish boozy family where yeah. you were used to like nothing to see here, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just drunk guys <laughs> working out their angry spirits. Yeah, it's all over. I, I was in Kansas City, and uh, I was doing Stanford and Sons or Sanford and Sons. I can't remember. And um, is that well, the name of the club? Yeah, it's called Sanford and Sons. And uh, <laughs> that's right. And. Uh, it, it, by the way, it's in a mall and then in the middle of nowhere in a mall, but a, 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 a mall in the middle of nowhere where they have those stores that like the jockey outlet, you know, those kinds of stores, you know what I mean? And then other stores like, you know, socks and right. just different socks. And you're like, there's nothing to do here. And there's a Starbucks, of course. So, uh, and there's a Dave and Buster's, uh, no, yeah. the, all the food is where just, you end up eating every, every meal yeah, yeah, yeah. because that's it's all there the is. The worst food in the world, but yep, that's right. And, uh, and it, there was a blizzard. Yeah, a blizzard happened, and they had to. Well, nobody was going to show up to my show, and they didn't. And so I, I was, I was stuck. I was stuck in my hotel room, and I never forgot. I think it was Will Arnett, one of my buddies, was doing some big movie, and he had his own TV show. And then Bradley Cooper was starting to get famous. And these were all my kind of friends, Your contemporaries at the time. And then yeah, Bradley Cooper, rising. and then yeah, and then a couple other guys were just killing it. And I was, I remember sitting in the Best Western. I think it was the Best Western. Doesn't matter. It was like that, or the. The Best Western is probably like better than it was. Okay, it, would be a step it was up. new. Just... It was very new and clean. And I was sitting in my in my hotel room alone while it was blizzarding out, and there's nowhere to go. And there was a Bible. I remember I opened the door, and there was a Bible, <laughs> and there was a Bible, and there was a, and then I, I was, and there was porn I could have watched on TV. There was a like literally porn, and I was like, I could watch porn or read the bot. That's where I'm at right now. Those are your choices. As it, yeah. And then I, this is so weird, but it was nighttime, and I got hungry, and I walked. I had rented a car, and I was walking down this this embankment, and I swear to God, this this beat up Toyota. Let's just call it a Corolla. Corolla why not? <laughs> why don't we bring it back? And these dudes, these uh, what looked like uh, uh, migrant workers. I mean, long hair, but but like they looked mean, and I swear to God, the guy goes. I've never I've never felt threatened where I was worried, and I'm in Kansas in a blizzard, and the guy goes, "Hey man, <laughs> want to play with us? You want to come play with us?" And I was like, "I'm about to get fucking robbed or killed or ra- raped." <laughs> I never forgot. I it was a sexual kind of weird predatory thing. 
And I went, I went, uh, police. There's police. I just pointed over there. I got to go police over there. I just kind of randomly pointed and said police. <laughs> and they kind of went, ah. And I was like, it was fucking terrifying. I would have just disappeared in a puff of, of snow. <laughs> <laughs> no trace of Brian as he's dragged into a car. Anyway, uh, I did fuck the guys. But the point is. Right. I'm sure at least yeah. there's a part of you that had to say, like, it. It's always a, a little bit of a compliment to be threatened with, with for, with, for with a group, guy to be with threatened gang rape <laughs> yeah. by migrant workers. At least you know you still got it. <laughs> I still get the kids still got it. Um, I know the day. I remember the day I stopped being molested as a child. I <laughs> thought I've lost it. I've lost my looks. <laughs> I remember my grandmother talking about the. She knew she was getting older when men stopped looking at her. Mm. Yeah. So. Uh, and I said, I still find you attractive. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And I did it with her too. Sure. This is the kind of show that you, you guys are tuning into. We don't <laughs> fuck around. Chin's just cackling over there. <laughs> oh, he's um, jerking off. That's right. He's, just off he's, camera. Jesus, Chin. <laughs> Kid's got a piece on him. My bad. <laughs> um, you're now no longer doing stand up because you've kind of, you've always been working. Like you played the agent I remember Kirstie Alley freaking out at how good you are as as the agent on Fat Actress. Remember we did that show together? Yes, I did. And you played a guy, and I think you had a bit of an accent. You had a bit of a, a Southern... Yeah, it was a real... There was a real agent, her real agent, and she hoped that I would mimic approximate. Him. Yeah, mimic him, so I just did my best. You did. Yes. That you're... was a really fun show, actually. I know. I know. You know where they went wrong? They should have treated it like it was a very serious show. And don't let them smell the joke. And I think that they tried to do the opposite. And that, it, was just know, a, it was just a bit of a rookie mistake in this it's, sense. And it's, it's really common, I think. Um, not, and not necessarily – I don't know if it was the producers. It was yeah. probably the studio people or the network people who yeah. – they, especially back then. Now they're much more comfortable with like uh, let it play a little more straight. You don't have to have a joke every five seconds yeah. or – you know, or in a lot of dramas, they'll let things, you know, play, bleed. they're mixing it up. Here's the problem. Now, like, for example, with the Goldbergs and things like this, what, what kills you in these TV shows is that they sell advertising space. So to squeeze in an extra 20 seconds, oh. 40 seconds, what do they do? They shorten the time, the pauses between the actors. Oh, I, I know Fucking this. Fucking timing. When you produce the show. Well, yeah. What I was... Uh, I, What's the show produced. you're producing and running? Oh, the show I'm doing right now is called Nobody's. It's on TV Land, and uh, it uh, is created by three friends, three old friends from the Groundlings, which is a theater that I'm from. And then it's produced yeah, for by you guys. For you guys who know, Mike McDonald was a. I mean, you're you're a, a, a sta- I mean, you're sort of an all star in terms of a Groundling. But if you think about who came out of the Groundlings, oh, it's wasn't insane. it? Wasn't it? Can you go through the list for a second? Will, Will Ferrell, Ferrell, Sherry O'Terry, uh, Maya Rudolph, Anna Gasteyer, Chris Kattan, uh, Chris Parnell, Kristen Wiig, Lisa Kristen Kudrow, Wiig. Cheryl Hines. Uh, Dude, I mean, did m- Steve Carell come out of there? No, he, he was, was second a, city. he was Second City. Yeah, uh, and I'm I'm probably I mean I'm sure I'm leaving out Mikey Day, Taron yeah. Killam, Taron Killam, um, yeah. so I many. Mean, it just goes on and on. So and on. many people, and then tons and tons of writers and producers. And well, I always like say that. that people who come to LA, they go, I want to be an actor. I go, go to the Groundlings. I just I just know what their track record is. They're great acting teachers. I was in acting class forever. There's Ivana Chubbuck. There's Howard Fine. There's right. all kinds of Beverly Hills Playhouse. Great. But there's something about the Groundlings that, like Rachel uh, Harris. Rachel Harris, another one. Another um, beast. Well, they and they also teach. I think they encourage you. What's good is they encourage you to go for character and to write. And so that's yeah. truly like for me that I think that's how I've ever gotten how I, whatever I've gotten has been partially because there was a writing element. And you know, if bl- you can write, then you eyes. can. <laughs> what? You know, if you can write your own stuff, then regardless yeah. of what kind of show you're on, you know, you, you can improvise a good line of dialogue or you can write your own vehicle. Or, you How know, long whatever. were you on Mad TV? I did 10. You get you did 10 years? I did 10. 10 fucking years. And, uh, and our ships just passed. Yeah, I only did two years. I got fired up the second I wasn't coming up with characters. Here's the thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's I, too bad. I, I would have I loved to have worked with you. Oh, I man, we would have had a blast. But you were on for 10 goddamn years. Yeah. I was. I knew, You're the I, longest running Mad TV alum because the show yeah. was 14 years. Right, right. I came in the year four and left were, the year before. Were you a bit years. of a? Were you? Did you? When you were an OG, mm-hmm. you must have been a bully. 
Did you bully the new kids? <laughs> I don't think Because you're so. taller than everybody. I don't think so. I don't think I was a bully. I was definitely... I loved when new people came on, especially when they were good, you know? Yeah. That was just like... I, I can remember like when Ike Barinholtz came on, and I I just pulled him aside and I said, you're, you're fucking great. Hold on to this job. You're yeah. a blast to work with. You yeah. Know? Would you have done anything different? Would you have stayed 10 years um, or not? Uh I'm I'm glad I did. I mean, I I knew because I didn't get on. I got on the show late. You know, yeah. most, I was like ten years practically older than everybody, even when I first got on the show. Yeah, and I knew how hard it was to get a job. So like the people that Sorry. were anxious to bail, which everybody was, um, it seemed. Yeah. Um, I knew that a job was hard to find. I felt, dude. I, I felt the ex- when I got the job, I was twenty seven, twenty eight. I just had been auditioning in New York for so long. Mm -hmm. And when I say so long, I mean four years. That was plenty of time for me to realize that I was, that that when I was on TV and I got this job, it was literally like holding it in a headlock. Yeah. I say this about this podcast. Look, man, you know, I make money on this podcast. How much? I I make a fortune. (laughs) I I own a helicopter. I'm going to give you my chopper phone number. But you, I, I mean, the fact that I have a steady source of income on this podcast, I do it twice a week, that we get, I think we're going to get maybe 11 million downloads this, this month. I don't even know what to say about it. But the, but the bottom line is, I am never letting this fucking go. It's that trauma yeah. of being an actor back in the day. When yeah. You just didn't know where the, and when I got fired from Mad TV, I thought I was going to go on to do huge things. And you're right. Everybody on the show is like, get me off this show. I want friends. I want my own. Well, then you then you realize oh i'm i'm getting back into the room with everybody else yep and i better win that audition and there's no second place and i have to be number 1 out of the fucking thousand people and there's there's five people that look exactly like you do oh, and kind of do or you know, better your looking stuff or, or they're better for it yeah it's uh yeah, I, I mean, I never get anything from auditions anyway. It's almost <laughs> always like from people i've already worked with Me too. or whatever and in fact uh that even when I was on Mad TV and knew, like, I, I just couldn't put on another wig or I didn't want to, you know, didn't want to do the baby character one more time. Um, I started, I asked to direct. It was another thing, too, because they, like, they're pretty cheap yeah, for, as far as TV jobs go. So I sort of said, all right, if you're not going to give me, you know, the big bag of money, let me do more things mm. and uh, try and learn a new trade so that I have... So something smart. to fall back on so smart. when I went back out. And I'm I'm really glad I did because yeah. I ended up directing a bunch. You're doing a lot of – you directed a lot. If you direct a lot of TV, I mean I know the last yeah. time I was talking to you, you were directing a shitload. Yeah, I've done like um, – uh, I don't know, like a, over 100 episodes. That's of, of a stuff. great job. Do you not love that? It's it's great. There, there, there are funny things about it. It's made me – I think it's probably made me a better – you were saying like were you a bully on Mad TV? I probably – I wouldn't say I was, but I definitely am sure I looked at things as an actor does. I took a lot of things for granted. And now I'm, I'd say I'm much more like aware of how hard everybody else around is working. And yeah. What all the people that show up way before you ever get there uh-huh. and who leave way after you leave and how hard how they're all just trying to help you look good. Yeah. The quality of people, I think, in the business who are behind the camera is second to none. Yeah. I feel like Grips and the crew are the people that, first of all, they live somewhere way out on a horse farm. Right. Right. Generally, uh, like north of Valencia. You fucking two hours, <laughs> yeah. three hours. The great They're line. up at three. They're up at three. They're there at five. Yep. They are smile on their face. They'll eat They'll eat ground chuck and like uh, and be happy styrofoam. With it. Yeah. And, be, and, and power through the whole fucking day. Right. It's incredible. And then they're the last to leave. And they'll drive again for three hours and they're back up. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I was I was directing a show that I won't say what it was, but there was an actress who had been brought to the set, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes earlier than we needed her. So she was kind of giving me a hard time about it, even though I wasn't, I didn't say bring me that actress. That's There's a whole sure. group of people that do all that. But she was coming to me to just sort of set it straight and... While we were having this conversation, or I should say I was listening to her complain, um, there was a wardrobe girl who was just kind of fixing her stuff and making her look good. Mm. And um, the wardrobe girl was pregnant, like nine years pregnant. Yeah, <laughs> she was yeah, so yeah. ready. Pop. And, you um, see, you, crowning. Yeah. Crowning. And the, 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 the play the actress made to me was like, I 
could I, this is 10 minutes I could have been spent with my child in, the, in my dressing room. I had to leave her and she was crying. Mm. And uh, mm. then she walked away. She, she sort of then was magnanimous, like, but just let's just not have it happen again type of thing. Oh, thanks. And then she left and the pregnant wardrobe girl just burst into tears and she said, I haven't seen my baby in four days because I didn't leave her at home and I have one on the way and she's complaining that she has to leave her in her trailer when she can go see her baby anytime. She just lost it. And I just thought like, oh my Holy God, fuck. remember this, you know? Yeah, remember this. It's called perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so that's why I always, like, I, I th- there's that saying, and there was a book I read one time that said, and the old wise guy in the book said, uh, happiness is wanting what you have. Mm-hmm. I want what I have. I, I, I have to say that maybe, <clears throat> I think part of the good thing about reading the newspaper or reading history, mm-hmm. it's going to sound silly, but I really mean this for people who are younger, uh, it gives you real perspective on how how much worse it could be and is oh, yeah, for yeah. so many people. So, you know, listen, I get to do what I love. I'm the best in the world at it, everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the main point of that conversation. It really is. It really is. Uh, so you're now directing – tell me the name of the TV show again. It's called Nobodies. <laughs> right. And it's a – Who's in it? It stars Brad three Pitt. nobodies. Okay. Um, but it's executive produced uh, along with me uh, by Melissa McCarthy oh, wow. and Ben Falcone. Another. Her husband. Melissa uh, McCarthy, another Growl- uh, yes. Growling. Yes. Uh, and by the way, my student from at the Get Growlings the when I was a teacher. So she and her husband Ben met in my class 20 years ago. And then the three stars of the show are also all Groundlings who were in, in my class. And it's kind of, I mean, the short version is like, you know when you're starting out and you're all in your tw- your twenties or whatever, and you're like, someday we should work on a sh- we're going to make a show together. Yeah. Like twenty years later, that actually happened. Wow. So, and so, what was Melissa like when you when you taught her? Uh, hilarious. I mean, truly, I didn't. There wasn't a thing I had to teach her. Wasn't a thing. Other than just like, oh mm-hmm. yeah, that's a good idea. Go with that. Well, it's funny because her shitting in a sink made her. She was so fucking funny in in, in Bridesmaids. That's how it made her. She was was knocking audiences over at the Groundlings from the... Day one. Day one. Yeah. Just, I mean, roaring. Yeah, you can see it. I mean, she's just... Some people are just fucking undeniable. Kristen Wiig is another one. And by the way, Kristen Wiig, so there, Melissa's in the show, Ben's in the show, Kristen Wiig's in the show. Um, She she guest stars occasionally. Uh, I'm in it. Um, uh, Killers. Killers. Yeah. Jason Bateman. Um, really, I love Jason. Allison Janney. Jesus. Um, Kristen Bell. Like it's wow. It's really and it's all people that and then tons and tons of groundlings who you haven't heard of but you will. I want to come in and do it. Great. Am I going to do something? I'm we'll very funny. Out for you. I, let me play I think the you're a really good actor. Me, actually, thank you. Let me put. Let me play the hero. There are no heroes. Okay. <laughs> Fuck. No. Uh, it sounds amazing. It's it's really fun. And then you know, like obviously we do write it, but there's lots and lots of play you know and you're and you're working with a bunch of your old friends so like it's it's the easiest shit in the world it's it's you know what man when you're around people like that okay that like you're talking about the joy is that everybody uh, speaks a language you know and that language is humor there's a there's a frequency that you operate on and there's an intimacy in that right yeah it's it's i mean it's truly um effortless yes because if you want to kill me Put me on a set with a bunch of dramatic actors uh, because I, I I get super fucking bored because I frankly find them very boring. Oh, well, because they're often quite earnest. And that's the worst. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, they're quite earnest. And that's a huge problem. I know you're in character. Paul Giamatti <clears throat> doing a movie called The Hangover 2. I don't know if you ever heard of it. I haven't. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'm probably not in the demo. Yeah. So I'm doing I'm doing uh, this movie. Paul Giamatti is nominated for a Golden Globe. We're going walk in a set. I say, dude, congrats. It's fucking huge. And he goes, yeah, you know. I say, well, you don't see me. He goes, it's just, you know, I love being around you guys. You're all comedians and I'm laughing. And it's like the acting gets in the way. And I'm on set in this thing and everybody's in costume and character. And they're all kind of being character and they're all actors. And it's, you know, it just gets to be a drag after a while. (laughs) I was like, well, yeah, that's exactly right. When you're with you know, Zach Galifianakis, and they're giving you the, they, they had a helicopter that was coming 
sort of the, the, the helicopter. They had the Michael Jordan of helicopter f- guys, right. and in the Hangover Two, the helicopter comes up over the Michael the Jordan building. is a shoe designer. Sorry, go on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. For Helicopter that. coming over the building. Coming over the building. And the blade was coming so fucking close to the, like, it was so crazy. He was an acrobat. That blade had hit. Metal would have gone everywhere. We, uh, we would have been decapitated. <laughs> Everything would have blown up. I never got it. And so you have a safety meeting, you know, and, and it, it's a very serious safety meeting. And, and, uh, and the guy, so the helicopter's going to come up, guys. And, you know, the, the danger here, obviously, is fire. Or if the blade hits the building, obviously, it could be catastrophic. We need you to hit the ground. When you're down on the ground, you come up. And when the plane comes up, you guys are going to land, go down. You know, there's a whole right. you know, process, a whole choreography. And Zach is like, um, uh, any questions? Zach is like, uh, yes. Yeah, sure. Zach is what color would the helicopter be? <laughs> he's not funny. He doesn't know. He's right. like, uh, blue, I think. Is it? And Zach goes, it's not going to work for me. Can we get a red one? He's just saying fucking bullshit like that. Or, or, or Todd Phillips comes over and gives, uh, I think it was Bradley, a note or something. And just try to make it a little bit more, you know, like that. And Bradley said, what are you going to do? Zach goes, I, I, have it on, I have an app on my phone here. And he just pushes, puts it against Bradley's face. It'll help you with your acting. I have an acting app on your phone. You know, so that kind of shit is so much fun when you're just around idiots. And well, that, that, my favorite thing at Mad TV, they would, they would make us do a sexual harassment seminar. Oh, my God. And, you know, they had the whole crew and cast. Everybody's up in the bleachers of the audience. And then these, uh, basically these fucking stiff lawyers or whatever. But they, <sighs> they made this, I can't believe they made the mistake. They go, why don't we, we'll do some role playing and let's bring uh, the cast members down. And so like, it was, hey, Mike, would you, you like to do it? Me. I was like, I would love to do it. And one of the girls, I think it was Nicole Parker. And we're, you know, like, so now let's just simulate, you know, say something inappropriate to Nicole. I was like, all right. Um, wow, you're dra- what a drawer full of big black dildos you've got. <laughs> you know? And they're, they're like, what? And then Nicole's like, would you like to try one? I'm like, yes. You know, she's just raping me with this big black dildo. And they're like, okay. okay. All right, uh, all right. This is already sexual it, harassment. It, 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 <laughs> I can smell your twat from here. So would that be considered? <laughs> is, that, is that far enough? Can exactly. I- you got a dick on you, huh? <laughs> is that a balloon? Is that a red balloon? Are you, is that a sticky red balloon? You're happy to see me. <laughs> and they would never, like, they didn't, they didn't laugh. They, nothing. Like, these people have no... Well, that's what the world we're living in. Right, you're right. Right? We're living in a world where everybody's terrified to make a move. Because your job and your reputation can be destroyed with a probe. And, <clears throat> and mine will. I mean, I'm, what, to what extent oh I have God. a job or a um, reputation, uh, I'm like all these people that are getting, you know, they're hacked or whatever. But I mean, I send, you have sent you some shit. Oh my God. Like the things I send. I still have is, it on my phone. Like, <laughs> like Michael, Michael goes, I have something like that. I get, I get, a, I get a, a video of just a dude bent over with a giant ball sack and and i haven't seen mike or talk to him in like three years i just get a it's a giant i go come to the podcast and i just get a video of a, a dude bent over with a giant ball sack and a woman in a, lo- a lingerie with with gloves on like small like mma gloves and she's punching him in the balls as i know I'm that for, you like fighting i do like fighting she's get this get this relentlessly pounding his balls as he's screaming in pain but won't get out of that position right no he's he could he could walk away but he doesn't no and i appreciate that i'm gonna bring you up on charges I, I yeah i'm amazed at how puritanical we become and i think the narrative is being driven by the radical left-wing ideologues or the radical sort of egalitarians who have no sense of humor who have right. no sexuality well they're literal crazy they're literalists that's the best way to put it they're literal uh, that's that is like i was at a party I actually tell this in my act, but uh, I was at a party <laughs> where it was a bunch of very liberal Hollywood powerful people were all standing around and they were talking about, they were ragging on the rest of America, flyover states. Aren't we lucky to be not living where, you know, in the shitty middle of the country? And, you know, here, like we have our daughter and it was a pool party. The daughter was four years old and she was naked, which, you know, she's four, who cares? Mm-hmm. But she's like jumping around the water and stuff and having a blast. And they're like, I mean, we're able to raise our child in a liberal environment you know and we're just so glad to be able to raise her as, as opposed to those uptight conservative flyover country and then who they've I, never a, met right and and then i go yeah but don't you think she's a little young to have be having her pussy shaved and 
<laughs> the inhale of it wasn't just air. Like I mean, I knew I knew I was wrong the second it was like oh, a boy. swing and a miss. Oh uh, yeah, and like, uh, I, I was going, f- and I literally uh, thought I was going for absurdity, you know, because yeah. she's four. There's nothing to shave, you know, and I. Couldn't couldn't back my way By out. By the way, it. it's a great joke at the expense of a four year old. It's a great <laughs> joke, you know. It's very funny and uh, outrageous. Well, yeah, because you think like, well, if I if I go super far, then they'll know that it's obviously a joke. And now you, I'm on a thread with Will Sasso and Crystalia, <laughs> and the the amount of obscenity, the amount of hor- horror that goes on. I mean, mm-hmm. if I, I would be ruined, I would be ruined because. I go out of my way to be as offensive as I can. Of course. I have, a, I have a theory, and I'm writing about this on my stand, in my stand-up. I think the white elite, these, the, the progressive elite, and it's usually white people, they're all well-meaning. Yes. But I don't think they know what to do with their guilt. There's, there is guilt to being – so if you study the history of this country, there yeah. is. There was injustice continue. There, there are guilt. black ghettos and every – I, I, I don't, I don't guilt. either because I'm, you're Irish and I'm Sicilian and I had nothing to do with anything. But <laughs> I really – I fuck off. And I'm, I, I come from Sicilian and Irish peasant stock. Go right. fuck yourself. I didn't have anything to do with it. I believe in fair play. I don't want to see – under uh, people be children who are of color or anybody else not get the same shit my kids get. I don't like it. I, I'm I'm all about equality of opportunity. I don't sure. want to enforce equality of outcome because that's retarded. Right. But I want to be able. Which but, is a word you can't say now. Oh, of course not. <laughs> no, because language means everything, and, and they, they you have the speech police out there, and the speech police will will ruin you. Will ruin you oh, when I'm you sh- use chocolate out of context, man. I'm telling <laughs> you, dude. So so you know, for me, I think what it is is. It's white. It's it's a lot of sort of powerful, progressive, white people. Typically, I'm sorry to say this, who haven't met a whole lot of who, who don't really have interaction with people who work with their hands. Mm. They haven't done any military service. Mm-hmm. They haven't done those things that put you in contact. Did this sort of visceral, objective contact with that kind of reality? I'm not saying they don't work hard. I'm not saying they don't have a lot to offer. Right. I'm trying to be fair here. But I think that their way of dealing with their guilt or trying to make the world a better place is that they they try to police other whites. Yeah, they well, try they're, to they're hall monitors. Force their and hall I, monitors. I never liked the hall monitor no, in school. No, so I anything the you background. say in the media, anything you say is construed as being racist. So this guy who is an old, he's seven years old, Verlitis. I can't remember his name. Uh, I used to watch him play tennis. Vita Scarolitis. Vita Scarolitis. Serena Williams is having a baby with um, the guy who owns Reddit. And he yes. did my podcast back in the day. Great guy. God bless him. She's pregnant. She's the greatest female tennis player ever. Not the greatest tennis player, but the greatest female tennis player ever. Um, which you and, also can't say. Which, of course, you can. Because <laughs> there was a debate about that. But she's not. And, but she's amazing. And she's a phenomenal player. And I right. love watching her play. Uh, he said, oh, that baby. I wonder what that baby's going to be. I bet milk chocolate. <clears throat> Now, he was just – he was not being racist. He was not being offensive. To him – I didn't hear about He this. said it was a compliment. To him, it was like, right. that's going to be a beautiful baby. Right. Which I would that, – that's how I would take it. Right. That's how he meant it. Right. She, Serena Williams, she has her own reason. Maybe she has a button on this stuff. She called it racist. Everybody else, a lot of other people did, came you know, kind of swarming all over. And he went, tell me, what did I say that was, a, that was racist? Right. And if you're going to start calling people racist for that – then what do you call the guy burning a cross in his fucking front lawn? Because there are racists. Right, right. But it really does cheapen the word, man. It does. When you, you know, so, so that we have to be careful with language. <clears throat> and I, I feel like um, they, it's really easy to blanket. Like uh, someone like you who makes something funny, as a comic, I feel like the last place that we can actually speak our mind is on stage. Well, that, and yeah. Not that's on TV one anymore. Of the, that's one of, the, definitely not. Although it's weird. We're, on the show Nobody's that I'm doing, which is also available on the TV Land app and downloadable and bingeable. Yeah, where, um, where we're, else is it we're messing around. Netflix. Uh, it, it's probably Hulu. I think it's going okay. to. Um, but uh, we're trying to get away. To me, that's what that's what uh, why I got into comedy was to see what I could get away with. Yeah. You know, like and to see what you if you can turn and not to, make to hurt anybody, funny, but to make people laugh. Of course, but I mean, like there there are people that make. Jokes about the Holocaust. Why? Not because they think the Holocaust is funny, but like that's that's also how you deal with pain in any way. Like, I mean, the first ep- sketch we did on Mad TV, my first my first sketch I ever did in the world when I got to Los Angeles, I played Schindler, <laughs> and it was called Schindler's Lost, and I couldn't find the Jews 
before they were being loaded onto trains <laughs> to save them. And she, and I'm driving, and she was she couldn't give me directions. It was the most offensive fucking thing. It was all it was written by Jewish people. Uh, it was also being produced by Jewish people. And Steven Spielberg got wind of it and said, "If you oh, that's right, I remember yep, this. If you if you air this, I'll do everything I can in my power to shut it down." John Blanchard, who was a Second City mm-hmm. badass who directed all the right. Second Cities and an amazing director, said, he "said you know how I stand where I stand on it." I said, "What?" He goes, "If he says that, you definitely run it." <laughs> you definitely run it. I, I say you run the fuck out of it because it's comedy. Right. And none of us believe in bulldozing Jews or killing Jews. Nobody, none of us believe in genocide. We're comedians. Yeah. And you're right. There there are some things that might be too raw to laugh at. I understand that that's offensive. But there's also something that says art disturbs, comedy kind of shakes you up a little bit. Right? I mean, what else do we have? Uh, to me, Otherwise, uh, they, they win, the bad guys. Uh, to me, I just <clears throat> always hope to... Do the impossible, and and that's the that's the fun thing for me is if I can get somebody to laugh at something that they would normally not laugh at, or if it like yeah, I like to see that look in their face like I shouldn't be laughing at this, but I am. Well, that that example of the four year old that's an outrageous thing to say, but it's it's outrageous. It's like Mike, you, like, <laughs> you know, you know, it's fucking funny. Uh, you know, uh, that was one of the things I actually liked about Mad TV. I felt like we went a little farther and a little harder maybe than some uh, other yeah. shows. Yeah. And like, uh, I was the last one to uh, say the real N word with the, you know, pronounced E R at the end. Really? Um, yeah. On, on Fox. Wow. And it was, um, it, we were doing this. The sketch was uh, Ari Spears, a very funny guy. He had sort of a running um, sketch. It was called real motherfucking talk. And it was like a kind of a, a black militant guy. And then he, he had usually all black guests and then a super out of touch white guy. And I always, that was like my stock and trade. Great. Great. So, and they had real, um, rappers on, I think it was like exhibit and try a, to bring a, this up. A, a Is it up? Do you think it'd be on YouTube? I think it would be. What would it, what's it called? Uh, real real motherfucking, motherfucking talk. <laughs> and, um, I'll be able to, I'll know which one it is. I mean, there's only about nine or 10, but anyway, um, we did the sketch and it it went really well. And you know the sketch was basically the same uh, three times around. Like, is uh, it right there? Oh, the uh, that's the one right there. The one with the exhibit or with you in here? That one, yeah. All right, <laughs> watch this. I gotta go with the tarts, baby. Mm, the cranial. Yeah, man, I'm only f-ing with the strudel. Mm. And the cranial. F Whitey. Oh, you haven't lived. You've had a croissant. I mean, nigger, please. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my fucking god! And I improvised that. Oh my god! <laughs> and they let they aired this. They did. What year was this? Uh, right before the Iraq War. God damn, that was two thousand three. <laughs> yeah, like so, 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 like if you say that, and this is in the context, and obviously with, you know, Aries. I mean, look at they haven't even they haven't even. They just keep reacting, and the, the the tally lights were just popping all around. Yeah, yeah. Which Artie Lang tells a story like this, where he was playing basketball, and he just kept hearing the word with all these black guys, and he goes, you know, pass the ball, and everything just stopped. Like, what? <laughs> that ain't your that ain't your word, right? Well, and that was my that that's was my point of of trying point, to do it. Though, was, where, that, 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 that's the funny, like like Rogan was saying that too. Rogan was saying just by saying the word nigger, you can get you can get in trouble. It, right. it, people go crazy just when the word is said. Right. And again, I understand the violence attached to that word. There are words like that. Faggot used to be a word that was used like it was an acceptable prejudice. When it's explained to you that that word is used when somebody's kicking your fucking head in for happen to be for liking somebody of the same sex and still happens. Oh, okay. I get it. I get why, why that would be offensive. Right. When you hear the when when the word nigger was used and, it, and a noose was being wrapped around your neck by a gang of white people, yeah, that's why. So when you understand the history of words and the violence that's attached to them and why the group that's been oppressed can use them, but you can't, I'm all about that. Well, I get yeah. that shit. And in their in, but, but in, in their... this case, you're just being you're being comedic. The whole point is that you the character miss. 
Right. He thinks Red, he's he situation. thinks he's now allowed. That right. was the whole point of it. But I and I will say in Aries, uh, you know, to, to Aries' credit, uh, that was the second take. And so I, I sort of said, I've got this idea. Let's just try it. And uh, they didn't know what was coming. And uh, Aries, Aries but Aries was great. And then afterward, there you know all the the network people came up like we can't. We were using the first take. And Aries said, "No, you've got to use the second take." Yeah, good for so him. So it was it really it was Aries. And, he's and okay. by the way, the rap he wasn't being disempowered. All, all three of them, they no loved shit, it. They no loved shit. It. And uh, by the way, our audience was no largely shit, it's a comedy. It's comedy, and it was and making the right point. It yes, wasn't like I was. I was yes, you're saying not, that I'm the asshole there for you saying go. exactly. You're not. You're not. You know, and and that's where we've lost our way. I, that's where we've lost our yeah, way. Yeah, because everyone's There's literal. A puritanical, literal. Sort of, uh, and it's 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 a form of it's a purge. It's sort of a form of um, like uh, it's a fundamentalism. It's a form of fundamentalism. Yeah. How dare you? How dare you say that word? You're taking power away from the people that have been oppressed, and, and it's like they want to out. They want to show the other group that they the other the other whites essentially their colleagues that they're even less prejudiced than the other than than you know they are right. They're, everybody's so busy trying to show how virtual virtuous they are. Yeah. That um, they everybody's lost their sense of humor. So now it's exactly and, what and happened. Human beings are still horrible people. Or human beings are still horrible. Often that's never going to change. You're not going to change the world by that. But now we're also going to not be able to laugh at anything. And oh that's well, be, be, like, but oh, but but, but but human beings, uh, the extremists hijack the public dialogue. When if you were in Mao Zedong's China and you were not not wholeheartedly committed to the communist party you would get outed and killed or put in jail Pol Pot's Cambodia other humorless places like all those places are there, humorless it becomes places. an ideology yeah 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 an ideology is you're either right or you're wrong there is no middle ground there's no room for humor right. or metaphor right. are you kidding me there is right there is the pure or there is the soiled there is gold or there's shit that is what an ideology is so and human beings, obviously, this is going to sound crazy, but we occupy the whole spectrum, don't we? We are sinners and we're saints and we're, so, we're always something in between. That my, my, my favorite thing is you got rid of all – if you killed all the quote-unquote racists, you'd still have racism because <laughs> we're all tribal and we all have right. – we all discriminate and we all judge and we all have a little of that in us. Louis C.K.'s joke um, – which I think is brilliant. He goes, I'm a little racist. I hope, I, I hope uh, I, he's already done this on a special. I think he has. He goes, I'm a little racist. He goes, I'm a little racist. He goes, like when I walk into a pizza joint and I see a bunch of black women making my pizza, I'm like, all right, well, I don't know. Yeah. like I get it. You know, it's a great joke because f- fuck you. We're human. Yeah. Stop it. Yeah. I'm glad we've settled all these problems. We really, we fixed a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your courage, for your comedic courage. Michael McDonald. <laughs> Uh, you're so fucking good, though. Uh, I'm surprised you don't act more. I mean, it, it's your choice, but you know what? What's the dream role? Uh, Do you have like a fame favorite actor? Somebody oh my god, I've got so many. I mean, I think my I would kill to be on Veep. God damn, that's a great show. Tell it's so him. good that I, I'm not even jealous of it. I'm I'm actually. Uh, I'm, I don't know how they all do it. I know, like, I know. They, I don't know how the writers write every character brilliantly, and there's a and how a director can get everyone um, firing on all cylinders. I don't know how the actors and I mean, she's brilliant. She's amazing. But they're all brilliant. That I whole know. cast is brilliant, and uh, I'm I'm jealous of it and scared of it and intimidated by it, and I killed to be on a show like that yeah i feel that way i feel that way about tina fey when i see the way she writes too she's like, kind of terrifyingly good she's too so isn't terrifyingly she? good like 30 rock like i'd watch it and i'd be like was she a, a ground she was she was uh second city? second city yeah i mean I, I she just blows me away sometimes when i watch it, i'm just like how the fuck are you that good a writer yeah and uh um kimmy schmidt is like a show that i mean I it's it's it. it's like a machine gun of jokes like it's boom 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 i mean and There's also, a joke after joke after joke, and you're like, wait, even the setup was a joke. Like, it's amazing. And when you've been doing it for as long as you and I have, and they're able to surprise you over and over again, yeah. that's where I'm like, I'm very, uh, yeah, it's intimidating. It's actually like, you're you're in awe. I, I don't even laugh, because I'm right. so blown away. Yeah, like, I'm kind of like I, that I, I find too. myself just watching it. Like, when I, I remember as a young man watching Ghostbusters, mm-hmm. uh, the first one, I was so 
entertained. I was so into the movie that all I could do was bite my nails. <laughs> I couldn't even laugh because I was, I was so – I didn't know what to do. Have you ever had somebody – like I've had one time uh, a show. There was a, a woman in the front row of one of my stand-up shows, and she was literally just like this. Oh, yeah, of course. And, you know, of course, it's the one face you can see and then it blacks. Oh, sure. And she came up afterwards and said, oh, I, I love the show. And I go, you stood there with your arms crossed the whole time. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I, I didn't even know. Like, I, That's what know? I do. If I really love what you're doing, I'll probably be the guy. That's why you haven't laughed at all. Today. That's why I haven't laughed once <laughs> and not once. Yeah, I probably would watch you and, and be that way. Because I'd be marveling at sort of like your ability to do character and put it all together. I mean, I, th- I think that's what I do when I watch friends of mine that are really good. Like I, who's like Sasso like, does that to me. Will Sasso yeah. kind of blows me away with how amazing he is at impressions and how amazing he is at coming up with original characters. Like he's done shit on Tim in a podcast to me where I was in the thing and I was like just – I was just watching him, and I was just like, I don't know how you do that. And he was really good. I mean, when I got on the, <clears throat> first got on the show, he was already there, but he was only like 22 or something. Oh, he was he a was fucking doing, pup. He was doing uh, impressions, which I always find. I think they're, those are the hardest. Yeah. But he was doing spot-on impressions. Like, and I think he's really the best weird. Ever. Did you ever see his um, uh, Randy Newman? Yes. I mean, because he has to sing, too. Yes. No, uh, no I, think he, really I, I, I think he's the best. Frank Caliendo is... Maybe the best ever, but but I think Sasso is actually better because all due respect to Frank, Sasso's better because he can do the other stuff. He can sing. He can right, right. act like it, he's such an amazing actor too. Like yeah. he's yeah. He's I painfully... would love to see him do a drama. Actually, I think well, so would interesting. I. Uh, but Frank Caliendo truly, his especially the sa- you know because he's got uh, physically you know he's a shorter guy and you know he's kind yeah. of uh, a got tower, a certain right? look, but um. So he can't always look exactly like, but it, which doesn't matter. But when he does, uh, like when we were at the table reads at Mad TV, and you know your your face is kind of in the script following along, you would just be hearing, and his he sounded like that person was in the room. It yeah. was so crazy. Yeah, yeah, he's, and I thought his bush was the best bush that anybody ever did. There's no doubt, and his and his other bush. <laughs> I thought you were saying it. I'm 10 years old. So you, 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 really, you give me an opening and I take the stupidest, I got it. lowest hanging fruit. Bro. But, um, oh, somebody you who was it? Somebody push? told me. Somebody, I was telling somebody we know mutually uh, that I was doing your podcast and she said something like, um, How long till you show each other your dinks? <laughs> First of all, don't call it a dink because dink <laughs> sounds tiny, sounds like a little piece of metal. And my dick. I like to say "deh." Yeah. Well, you got to get some air in it because it's so heavy. Hey, hey, bro, come here. Let me show you my "deh." <laughs> you know what I mean? There's something ominous about that. Hey, come over here. I want to show you my "deh." Were you in Buffalo or um, Kansas City? I was in, in Kansas City. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> During a blizzard, were you were you in the car? <laughs> I was, dude. You were playing a migrant worker. I thought those blue I eyes threw work. me off. <laughs> and that dink. <laughs> Let me show you my dink. Your dink. <laughs> I can't stand those kinds of things. My dink. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Orange County. You did? Yeah. When did you know you were funny? That's a, a question I will never answer because I think you can't answer it without sounding like an asshole. And I'll tell you why. I know like, what you mean. We, I, I did an interview in the very early years of Mad TV. They would... They would take like two or three of us and they would, you know, because one wasn't a celebrity. So they'd be like, well, if, let's get two. Will you take two? Right. And um, some uh, interviewer asked us, uh, at what age did you know you were a comic genius? And uh, I knew not to answer the question that way. But the other person I was with said, for me, I guess it was kindergarten. Oh, and I was like, you don't do that. Like, you just lost. Yeah. You, uh, I knew I liked comedy very early because I grew up in a funny family. Who makes you laugh the hardest? You have a favorite comic? Wow. Um, I think I'd probably have to say Bill Burr. Bill Burr's pretty amazing, isn't he? I and I, there are so many. I mean, yeah. I, I really love so many of them. How but, about actors, comedic actors? I think for me it was Bill Murray or, or Hartman, Phil Hartman. Mm-hmm. I love them both. And Phil Hartman, by the way, rest his soul, was such a nice guy. He was a groundling. 
He was a groundling too. Yeah. Did you work with him? Uh, I did. Um, I mean, he, not. I like. He came did back. You know and Will did Ferrell a, pretty well because he was a groundling yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Phil Hartman, in fact, tried to. He got me an audition for SNL, but um, he came back and did like a charity event, and uh, then had me do some improv with him. And it was him, John Lovitz, um, De- uh, John uh, Dennis a, Miller. They were both Crowleys. Uh, no, but they were. Uh, John Lovitz was. Yeah. But we just he Phil did this thing, or maybe it was Dennis's charity. It was Dennis's charity, and so they all did it. And Phil asked me to do it, and I got to perform with all these greats. And yeah. he was such a such a quality human being yeah phil fucking and funny i i i know i remember uh calling rogan about it yeah after somebody told me about it and i was just like what his wife because i remember rogan used to talk about his wife well that was you know it was funny because when i did that show it was uh i think it was like a week before it happened yeah and she was there and like yeah you do you Trophy wouldn't wife. you wouldn't know you would not know no drugs yeah Good stuff i yeah Nobody did blow crack or meth and it worked out. Or <laughs> you know what I mean? Nobody was like, well, I had a lot of problems and then I kind of upped my dosage of heroin. And then and things, things fell into place. Got, <laughs> things fell into place. I did do meth for three years and I have to say I got better at jujitsu. Um, that's never been the case. No. My room got cleaner. <laughs> my skin got more holes in it. I finally found that. I, string in my face i've been trying to dig for <laughs> you i can't imagine you <laughs> on coke like i've done blow before i'm sure yeah no no but not a lot because i don't like it i think it's it's <clears throat> terrible i think it's awful and oh. i hate uh what it does to people yeah yeah i've had people say i've had people give me blow where they're like this stuff is sticky it's so pure and i'm like oh i don't i'm not a coke guy and then i'll i'll do it just to see if it because i love the feeling of coffee with the mm-hmm. buzz the coffee gives me. I think I have so much dopamine already. Like I have serotonin or whatever yeah. good, I have good levels that, that uh, it just makes me, it, I become a little bit of a rat where I'll sit there and I, and I, I move my mouth and I, I don't like myself. So I, I don't do cocaine. And, and now know, I don't do cocaine. Like now I would never do blow, but here's why, because I think that the industry, I don't know if you know this, but it, you know, you know, they your cocaine. You. Well, also, to get the, it from plant to powder, it requires a lot of murder. And there's no <laughs> union. And they don't have good practice, good labor laws. Ah. Like, don't tell me about how you fucking eat sustainably Locally sourced. sourced. <laughs> yeah. Go fuck yourself while you're doing blow. Blow is a murderous, it's a murderous product. There's a lot of, uh, you know, communities are destroyed and fucking, you know, all kinds of shit happens in Mexico and you know what I'm saying? Like, so I feel guilty. I'd feel guilty getting high. I love that you said you don't like yourself when you you Ooh, were no. high on coke. I yeah. loved myself oh, when did. I was high on coke, oh, and did. that was the problem. Like, I thought I was amazing, and really, <laughs> I've got a lot of interesting things to say. Oh no, that's Sit for sure. Back. <laughs> oh no, you'll start a business together. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it was the worst. The worst. And I'm, I haven't. I did it so few times. I never really liked it. Thank yeah. God. Yeah, I can. You and I doing blow would be like. So why don't we start a shoe company? We'll call it Michael Jordan, but we'll spell it with a G. That's the kind of fucking idea you have. Yeah, Chin can sing the jingles. Mm-hmm. Chin, were you ever a coke guy? No, no. It seems like it's. Were you a out booze guy? Did you? Yeah, I'm. I, I love. Uh, I love. I love red wine. Me too. And, uh, Me too. Red wine and a little pot would be. Yeah, I like red wine. I like a little sipping tequila, uh, and, I, and I like to fuck. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I did um I did that another podcast getting high, uh, Doug with high. Have you ever heard about it? Getting or Doug with high or high with Doug? It's called getting Doug, Doug with high. Is this Doug Benson? <laughs> mm-hmm. No, I I haven't done it. No, I haven't uh, heard. Well, it. you like literally it's like, you know, a small little room like this and they just pass out the pot and wow. you get high on camera on the podcast and yeah. then and then talk about stuff. I've done that on Rogan. <laughs> I've smoked weed with Rogan, and I've gotten so I don't know what kind of weed he has, but you, you gotta be careful. You're like um, if if Joe Rogan is Batman, you would be his Robin. Robin, yeah. Well, I'm Joe Rogan light, as he likes to refer to me. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm Joe Rogan before they put the water in, and he's you know he stretches out. I've never actually met Joe. You Rogan. never read, mm-hmm. met Joe? Joe's one of my closest, oldest friends. Joe is. Joe might be the most unique person in many ways. Very hard to pin down. He hunts. He can sketch, plays pool, 
He's an amazing artist. He can draw really well. I think he's, he's an insane he impressionist. Very smart. Oh my god! Well, he's an insane impressionist. There's certain things people don't know about him. One is he can draft. He can draw like with the best of them. <laughs> he's a notch below pro as a pool player. He is. Um, he's an incredible impressionist. He's as good as almost anybody. And a huge racist. And a massive <laughs> racist. No. Uh, yeah. And and. Uh, but he can draw. <laughs> he's got a piece on him. Uh, he's uh, and he's uh, a. Uh, you know, took Taekwondo as far as it could go. Like he's done, he's got all these interests. Now he's obsessed with archery. He kills animals with a bow and arrow. Oh man. Yeah. He's a maniac. He always has game meat in his freezer, which reminds me, I have to go raid his freezer. <laughs> and yet he also has the, the main thing that I love about him is he said his biggest accomplishment is, is achieving peace of mind. Cause when he was younger, he went, he had a very tough childhood mm -hmm. and the world was a very dangerous place. And he kept everybody, man, at arm's length. I was one of the few people allowed in. But he was tough because, you know, he, he was he was basically terrified of the world. And, and, you know, if you got too close, he'd punch you or kick you away. You know, it was mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But he found peace of mind. He, I've never met anybody who's more ruthless with themselves. He's always growing. Like, he's never not worked out. Right. There's no one more disciplined. There's no one who doesn't show up. And his podcast is the biggest podcast in the world. Is it? Yes. And the, the main thing that I really appreciate about him is that he has taken that podcast where it used to be just kind of talking to dudes about fighting or comedians. He has the leaders of thought in every field. Yeah, that, I, Science. That's how I stumbled geology. upon it was Fuck. like there was somebody I was interested in who was um, – they were writing uh, history. Mm -hmm. And he had this – author on dan like, carlin or, or, or yeah um, he's had some amazing people on. yeah and uh and continues to yeah and i and and he was obviously he was conversant in it and he clearly um if he isn't formally educated he you know, educated himself well he's also he's got interest he's a seems. maverick and he has other mavericks on so the, he, kelly brogan um she's a she's a psychiatrist uh, not a psychotherapist a psychiatrist she can prescribe medication Oh, she went to medical school and everything else. I do have her number. I do have her number. <laughs> and she, um, I listen to the podcast and I, I, I appreciate it very much. She's written a book called A Mind of Your Own. And what she found was that when she was treating these psych patients and she would get the, the hardest cases, mm -hmm. the first thing that uh, they do is they prescribe you medication. And medication, psychopharmacology, is a hit or miss kind of science. Yeah. Sometimes you're on three different medications, seven different medications that then they, they, up the dosage, lower the dosage, and it's it doesn't always work. I know somebody who's bipolar who it doesn't work for, and it's hit or miss. It does. By the way, I want to be fair. I'm sure it saves some lives. I'm sure it does something for people. But yeah, I, I know a couple people that it. She it got works. very very frustrated with the world and and started to look at what other alternatives were. And the orthodoxy in the medical community is just you got a problem. Let's give you. I'll, let me give you a right prescription. And I kind of appreciate that he's showcasing people that are kind of turncoat physicians and, and sort of people that are thinking outside the box right. because these problems need to be thought of outside the box. Um, and like, for example, I had plaque psoriasis. So you know what that is? I only heard about it because there's like some medicine that is always advertised. Humira. Yeah. So I had plaque psoriasis and I would get every year – I would start getting it on my legs. So if I wore shorts, it was not a pretty sight, man. <laughs> I mean, it looked like like I had some kind of crazy disease. And I went to the, the dermatologist, and they go, you know, it's an autoimmune disease. It's the cells cluster together, and it, there's nothing we can do about it. But let me give you a steroidal cream, and let me give you another cream. And they'd always give you a cream. The cream would never work. And then I start getting it on my face and on my ears. And I was like, this something's fucking up, man. This is bad. So I did some research, and I did some. I'm reading, and I did reading by other doctors. Not, and I did some reading on the science and the literature. And the first thing that a dermatologist will tell you, uh, and I've spoken to a number of them, is it's not related to diet. Problem is that it is related to diet. And you read a book like The Plant Paradox. You read these different books where doctors are going. I've been treating patients for 35 years. I've done my own experiments on this, and it looks like corn, soy, wheat especially these whole wheats with all the lectins in them, all these sort of like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the plant, when you have the fiber, you use the fiber, you use brown rice. The, the, the fiber in the plant is, keeps the insects and birds away. It creates, it's got poisons in it. Those poisons also affect you. Long story short, when I took out cow dairy, when I took out fucking uh, wheat, my psoriasis went away 
It went wow. away. My plaque psoriasis that they said was only getting worse and that they were only giving medication for, it just went away. I don't have that problem anymore. Now, be careful about using anecdotal evidence. But by the way, since then, I've read a number of books that point at doctors to say, yeah. And I went to a doctor who thinks out of the box. He's a medical doctor. But he went, um, try not eating wheat and your bloat will go away. Try not eating wheat and your psoriasis may go away. Try keeping cow protein out and see what happens. Bingo, it fucking worked. Not placebo because I'm a skeptic. You know, I was like, yeah, whatever. But, you know, so Rogan seems to be showcasing people that have answers to problems that we're told don't have answers to. That's what I like. Mm, Cool. Yeah. So anybody out there has psoriasis, try taking all wheat, not just gluten-free. Just take it out. No corn, no soy. It's right out. And write to me. Tell me if it works. And no fucking dairy. Except for sheep or goat dairy. <laughs> Thanks, guys. This and has Brent. been Skin Talk. That was a psoriasis. <laughs> that was a psoriasis. Uh, yeah, because Humira, which works. My buddy's got really bad psoriasis. Humira works, but it, it ups your chances of having lymphoma and things like that, from what I see. So wow. fuck off. Wow. Yeah. Anyway. I'm, I don't have any conditions. You don't, do you? No. You just have that Irish, that good Irish stock. The the type that um, actually that's not true. I do have one thing. Speaking of Irish Irish uh, stock, they it's uh, called hemochromatosis, and what it is is it, your blood uh, iron you know is bad for you. Yeah, at, too much. In a iron. certain yeah, at a certain level, yeah. and um, hemochromatosis is something about your liver that it can't process iron and it so it just builds up in your blood to an unhealthy level and then it, it can give you uh you can die of cirrhosis from never never even having a drink oh. it's liver you know that's pretty significant michael so before but, you start saying you have nothing going on well, wait but here's the treatment and this is the weirdest thing there's no fix for it other than they have to let out your blood oh yeah because then you create new blood and what it does is as a percentage of your blood the iron level goes down because right. all the new blood doesn't have iron in it yet so you have to like change your oil. How often does that happen to you? It depends on who you are, where you are with it. And I've only had to do it like once a year. But they Oh, just once a year. You don't have vampire bats that live in your <laughs> But the the weird thing is is like and they take I've I've donated blood before, but I've never they take out so much that you kind of Yeah. It, it's almost like you get drunk. You I think if I was ever to kill myself, I would probably sl- slit my wrists. Yeah. Only because it actually doesn't hurt and you just kind of... Really? You just bleed out? Yeah. But um, it's it's terrifying, man. They The needle that they have is like a... You know, normally it's like a pin. This yeah. is like a suction. It, it's really... And, and they take a my, pint out? They take a, a lot out. A, a, so much that I don't even know if you're allowed to... Uh, so there, there, there's, there's a doctor that I that talked about It's called about a phlebotomy. This. A phlebotomy. Yeah. Because there's a doctor that talked about what women tend to not die uh, as often of stroke and of you know, and and one of the, uh, because one of the of their theories is because they, they they bleed yeah. yeah, and he said give blood once a year and your cholesterol your blood won't be as sticky and it's the same idea mm-hmm. which uh, I can't give blood because I had hepatitis A as a kid mm. yeah from eating shit or actually just living in the third world or just being a first class rimmer. <laughs> yeah, I was a fucking real rimmer as a kid. I, you, you had guys what, were being funny. <laughs> you had what they call the taste. Being a first class <laughs> rimmer. <laughs> Top notch. An A plus rimmer. You fucking rimmer. I remember I had a girl say that to me one time in Florida. She goes, my favorite thing, having my ass eaten. She was super cute, but I was like, it's an aggressive thing to say to me. And I'm, <laughs> as a challenge, I'll do it, but God damn it. And this was this was happened when you were a kid. Yeah, I was a uh, I was a kid of twenty three. Um, yeah, I uh, I've had uh, I've had a woman I've talked about this before get into the old bunny hole and really start working her tongue around the old rim and more. I was like, you're trying to get in my my, my bunny hole, so you got a fetish for poo poo, and I don't give a shit what anybody says. And I had a problem with it. <laughs> I mean, how? I mean, can you not peel? Can you not peel my like piece after? with both thumbs, <laughs> like you're looking for something serious, and then get that fucking that that lizard tongue way up in there? I was like a Paul. I'm standing there like. What the fuck is going on here, man? You were when standing? I say stand, I was standing in the bathroom, <laughs> bent over the sink, with tears, with tears just just coming down my my boy cheeks. And when I say boy cheeks, again, I was twenty six or something. 
<laughs> I'm always really paranoid. I'm going to say something like, and I was 42, and my wife is going to be like, hey, I was married to you, you motherfucker. <laughs> no, I didn't mean it. I'm doing math. <laughs> um, yeah, I've had some, I put up some numbers, Mike, and that's the point. <laughs> hey, bro, bro, I'll put up some fucking numbers. What have you been doing? Fucking. <laughs> What'd you do over the weekend? I fucked. <laughs> I rimmed. <laughs> a first class rimmer. <laughs> I like that there are kind of pauses in this podcast. <laughs> is it, is this a pause? <laughs> no. There's been no pauses at all. Um are you do you are you afraid of silence? No. Um I'm really not. As I get older, um you know, as I get older, I'm afraid. I swear to God, I'm less, so much less afraid of death. I just don't want to leave my kids behind. How many do you have? Two. I'm a at five one. year old and a nine. Okay, I met the I met the younger one. The other you met day. the younger one. I just don't. I don't want anybody else raising them. They might not be nice to them. And I have things I want to teach them, and that that's important. And I'm sure you know. It's like just what a drag to like have 18. them. Then wow, what a yeah. what. A, Otherwise, I would die. Sounds isolating. <laughs> I love, I love, my, my nieces are over and they're spending two weeks with me. My, my house is like, it's chaos with two dogs, but I kind of like it. I kind of like the noise. Really? Yeah. And I used to, I used to, I grew up with this Italian insane. My mother loved a mob. Where did you grow up? Well, of course. She called it a mob scene. Well. Not that mob, you silly goose. <laughs> the mob. Was she, was she just making pizza for the. Yeah, as I made a pizza for you. Uh, <laughs> terrible. Where Italian did you grow accent. up? I grew up all over the world. Philippines, India, Greece, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Pakistan. I moved to the States when I was uh, 14. Mm. Yes. I went to boarding school in Massachusetts, college in Washington, D.C., at American University where I studied history, ladies and gentlemen. I then went to New York and worked at Lehman Brothers. I then decided I had to be a great actor, and I became... The greatest actor known to me. I my first job. I went to business school and was a loan officer in a bank. Get the fuck out! I'm of not here. kidding. Where'd you go to business school? USC. I didn't know that. Yeah. Before you came to your senses. <laughs> I in fact. Are you good? Are you a good businessman? Are you good with your money and all that? I'm good with my money. Yeah. You are. Yeah. I mean, I'm mostly just uh, conservative about it. Do you have family? That, does your family have money? My parents were self-made. Like they were Irish. Uh, all my grandparents came from Ireland. Really? They were all cleaning ladies and uh, worked, like, I think my grandpa worked in a candy store. You Blue know, collar as a, people. Totally, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I grew up, my parents were very much all about um, work really hard, um, don't do anything dumb, <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh, because the world is a harsh place. Man, my biggest worry is that my kids are going to do something, one dumb thing. My son, one dumb thing. It's right? all it takes. It's you know? all it takes for your life to be. And I've done, by the way, many the dumb things, oh, but I've just been lucky. Yeah, no shit. You know? So have I. One dumb thing. Yes to the wrong group of guys on mm-hmm. a Saturday night and some shit happens and yeah. somebody dies or mm-hmm. is maimed for life and your life is done. And with the internet. Uh, thank God I didn't with have the that. the fucking up. internet. You, it's on. It's, it lives forever. Mm-hmm. You took your pants down, you wagged your dicks at somebody, yeah. uh, you got in a fight, and then you, you know, whatever you did, your employer can look that up. That's one of the reasons why, frankly, why I don't like, to the, it's not like it happens every day, but even after shows or whatever, I don't love having my picture taken uh, on people's phones because it's, uh-huh. It's, uh-huh. it's out there forever. Oh, and, yeah. And I don't know, like... People can figure out where you are, that you're not at home. Worse than that. It's worse than that. So there was an audition for this TV show. And the line was, it was basically how Big Brother was watching and how technology is getting to a point where the NSA can watch you and Mm -hmm. everybody else. You have drones. You know, you have these drones that, we have drones that can, or planes that can take pictures every second or less of the entire Los Angeles basin. So that if you're in a van and you commit a robbery, they can follow where that van is. It's very effective. They took down a drug cartel. Uh, Radio Lab did a, a thing on it. But here's the bigger thing. In the audition I did, he said, you know, someday they're going to have digital archivists. And those digital archivists can, f- 
can you can can tell your grandchildren who you really were <laughs> because every text you've ever sent I'm, de- I'm, dead. Ever sent, I'm dead. I'm dead. Me too. I'm Me dead. too. Ha- every picture, everything you ever sent, there is there is a digital record of it. It is out there. It will be you there will be programs and people that can dig it all up and put it into a book and well, sell it to your relatives or your enemies. That is going to exist. So yeah, I'm fucked. And I think we all are. I also believe though that when we die, um, that essentially is what is um the that is what yeah, the afterlife is. Is that anyway. every everything is just known. Every you everything about you is known. That's yeah. That's just it. Yeah, and I don't think I think if everybody knew everything about me I don't think it would be that incriminating because I'm not a bad guy. Yeah. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fuck up and I'm not a bad guy. I'd right? be embarrassed. Like, I'm a pervert and I'm, you know what I mean? Like, okay, I, like, like me and Sasso, it's all, it's all sex related in one way or another. Or right, it's right. all, or it's outrageous behavior, but I don't mean it. Right. right. So, I, I, yeah, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, uh, I don't touch children. I don't kill right. animals. I don't you kill m- people. You murdered somebody. <laughs> yeah. The, the, those things are, 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 you know, there, there are certain things that I, I would never, that I, I, can never excuse if you abuse children then then no matter who you are or what you've done you're you're right. dead to me right. right i'm thinking of the bad things of like when i don't know if somebody was telling me about their problems and my mind drifted well <laughs> you know, that's good that's, like that's that. a great example <laughs> like that's a great example or like or i was thinking about like the other day a friend was telling me something and by the way they had told me this before many mm-hmm. times so it wasn't the first time but um and I, I just started thinking about what I was gonna make for dinner, and I just thought, oh no, like what? I had a friend. This come is to going me. on the permanent record. Oh yeah, but you, but you know, hey, that's called being human, and we've all been that way. It's like my friend who said one time, a buddy of mine uh, got pancreatic cancer, and he was gonna die, and he did die, and um, we, my buddy, felt guilty. I said, why? He goes, I'm just gonna say this to you, and I don't. He goes, I'm already detaching. I'm already. Detaching. <laughs> wow. He goes, I already kind of accepted he's going to die, and I don't want to see him anymore. Oh, I thought you and, said the the friend who died of pancreatic cancer was saying, I'm detaching. Oh, okay, no, I'm but going. I'm sure he was, too. Only he had two kids, and it was fucking terrible. Oh, my God. Yeah, and they were really small. You know, it was fucking terrible. But Sorry, so your friend, um, who was a, a mutual friend of the guy with pancreatic cancer, was saying, I'm yeah. detaching from that guy. Yeah, he, he felt guilty because he didn't want to deal with the pain. He didn't know how to deal with it. Right. Yeah, it's called being human, man. I get right. that shit. When my dog got cancer, my wife got really mad at me because I'd started to detach. <laughs> I was like, dog's going to die. And I stopped petting the dog. So much. She goes, I can see you're not petting the dog. You're a fucking scumbag. I go, it's the way I protect myself. She's got to go to the great beyond. I'll rescue another dog that's in jail. It's all good. I didn't. I bought pure breeds because mutts are for the poor. But here's the thing, Mike. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so yeah, we're, we're all human. We're human, man. Right. I think that one of the things people have trouble living down is when they've they've been in, and I've never been in this, but they've been in terrifying situations, and they act, they behave in a cowardly manner. Mm-hmm. They they back down, they cower, and I always try. I, I think that's the wrong way to treat yourself. My buddy was with his girlfriend. These guys were making noise downstairs. He comes down. He's a beautiful one hum, human being who helps children. And the dude goes, fuck you, bro. You got something to say? I'll kick your fucking ass. I'll make as much noise as I want. And this girl was watching from the window. And he goes, Brian, I was terrified. This guy was big and tough. And he was I didn't know what to do. So I went back upstairs. And he was so blown away. I go, Bubba, smart. That's, that's <laughs> called being intelligent. Yeah. If, I, if Brendan Schaub, and I don't know him, is in my face and he's going to kick my ass because I went down and told him to take it down, Notch. I'm going to go, all right, go back upstairs. And I'm saying to my girl, don't you say a fucking word to me. That guy's a killer and I don't care. I'll eat a dick. I'll eat a dick so I don't lose my teeth and have my nose stomped in or worse. Right. Because it's called being intelligent. Yeah. Pick your battles. I might get you later. I might get you later. I might get in my window and go, now the door's locked, you fucker. I'm going to shoot you with my pellet gun. You're lucky. (laughs) <laughs> you dick maybe a little a little um 
a little well-placed dog poo, something like that. And they're like, there, I got him. Or out human poo. I'll sure. poo in my hand and throw it at him like a monkey <laughs> from the window. That'll be really attractive to my girl. I couldn't fight him, but watch this. <laughs> oh, God. Sorry, honey. Yeah. My hero. <laughs> Throwing your shit at somebody from a window? That's a good way to get back at somebody. Well, that might be the only and way. And I to... had hepatitis, you fuck. Because <laughs> I was a world-class rimmer. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever get in a fight uh yeah i'm i was only in like a couple of fights as a kid and so you're was, a big guy uh i beat you up though you can't fight i think i have something in me that people don't know rage which is yeah like it at the very few times i've ever been in fights it's sort of like i'm i'm okay with dying like <laughs> or i don't care if you kill me i'm going to make this so painful for you <laughs> that you you will be bummed. You that's, know, like something, that's, that's something to say. That's the only thing I've got. Yeah, is, that's... Is great. Let's go nuclear. But I ne- almost never do. Well, my buddy, my buddy who... I always tell the story, he's the toughest guy in the world. And, and my other buddy was there. And they were surfing in Malibu. He's a tough motherfucker. Been wrestling his whole life. And, and big. He's big. And these guys came up and they went, get the fuck off our wave. And my buddy Bob goes... What? What? And the guy goes, you heard what the fuck I said. Get off our wave. And my buddy goes, huh? How long can you hold your breath, bro? (laughs) They're on boards right now in the water. And the guy goes, what? He goes, I said, how long can you hold your breath? He's talking loud like this. My buddy's been calling his records. Because I'm going to jump off my board. I'll grab you by the hair. I'll bring us down to the bottom of the ocean. I can hold my breath for seven minutes. I bet you can't do that, and you'll just fucking die. And then I'll come back up and get you. So you guys want to dance or what? So they fucking looked at him, and they paddled right back to shore. They got their buddies, and they're waiting for him. And my buddy goes, well, here goes nothing. And Khan is a tough fucking stuntman. He goes, bro, this is bad. And my buddy took his, unzipped his, like, wetsuit. He's ridiculously muscular. He's on the cover of Muscle and Fitness back in the day. He could do the Iron Cross. He's 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 the fucking we call him the human champ. He's so strong, but this is like <laughs> six dudes. Really, I mean, I don't care who you are; they're all tough too. And my buddy goes like this. My buddy goes, "All right, looks like somebody's gonna lose a nose or an eye. Let's go!" And he just he was game to go, and everybody knew that somebody was gonna you were gonna beat him up, but you somebody in this group, we got a one in six chance. I'm losing a nose. You're gonna be in a, you, somebody's gonna wear an eye patch the rest of your life, <laughs> and another guy's not gonna have a fucking nose. All right. So as long as we know that, as long as you, I'm not gambling on those odds. I'm not going. <laughs> that dude's gonna bite. He's gonna be a face biter and an eye gouger, and he's big and he's a fucking chimp. I don't want to fuck with that guy. A guy in the group recognized him because he used to wrestle with Rico Chipparelli uh, over, like I guess, like he used to train with him periodically. And he goes, do you wrestle with Rico? And he goes, sure did. Been wrestling since I was seven. And they go, ah, he's cool. And, they, and then they ended up being like, ah, 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 ah. Uh, yeah, chimpanzee <laughs> politics, right? We're all fucking apes. Ah, ooh, 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 he's alpha, alpha. Ooh. My buddy was like ready to go. He's a fucking ape. He's, he's that guy who when they see a great white shark, shark sighting, he goes and surfs on purpose. He's that guy. You're fucking nut. And I'm not. I'm not. No. Mm-hmm. You're too. You're too uh, beautiful. Yeah. There's too much to damage. Mm-hmm. 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 And I'm also, <laughs> I'm also coward. I'm coward, delicate coward. <laughs> and I'll admit it. I get the only thing I'll do is I'll fight a bully. If you uh, fuck with my friend, you fuck with somebody. I, I get, I get so angry. I've, I've found that ninety, ninety percent of the time you can joke your way out of something. I can, thank God. First of all, I'm 50 now, so they're not really, they're not going to really try to beat me up, right? There was some jujitsu guy, I don't know, who, he was he was calling me out or something on a Instagram, some weird video, and he, he thought I was, he, he'd seen something about me and he had this wrong impression of me. I think he thought I was being serious or something. I don't, I don't remember, I don't follow these things. I didn't see it, I wouldn't, you know, hey, fucking look at this, oh, okay. But um, he found out that I was 50, <laughs> And posted another video and saying, hey, his credit, he looks like he's 40. I didn't know he was an old man. I was like, God damn it, I am an old man. Yeah, yeah, like, tough guys aren't going to beat me up because I'm an old man. It would be embarrassing at 50. You know, what are you going to do? It's, it's, those kind of fucking moments where, where I'm with my, my feature, Stevie Blue Eyes, who's 31. 
And this woman goes, Could father, be. son. <laughs> I was like, motherfucker. Yeah. I get, I'm getting the old eyes. I, it's, tr- it's so strange though. Don't like, I'll, I don't know. We, we work in the business where you're sometimes paired. You're working all day with somebody who's 21 years old or whatever, you know, or even 18 or tw- whatever it is. There was a, there was a, a guy I was working with and he was 30 mm. and, you know, 30 is like an adult. And so I think of myself as like, you know, we're, we're the same, we're, you know, the same uh, level and everything. And then he said something like, oh, um, I can't, we're, we're all going to go out for drinks or something. And he was like, uh, I can't, it's my dad's 51st birthday. And I was like, I'm 52. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- oh, I, I thought we were like, I know. you know, contemporaries. I know. Like. Jesus. I had a girl give me business. Um, I'm only saying this because it was in my wife's hometown. and But I, it was so readily apparent that I was talking to the guy she was with, but she was, I guess, not with him. And he was sort of, in a weird way, offering her up in a way. Like, she liked me. And I was like, <laughs> I go, how old your mother? She goes, 46. I went, <laughs> all right. Yeah, So so just so you know, I'm... Four years older than your mom, <laughs> and I have a huge heart on right now, but I'm not going to do it. No, it was. It's interesting. Getting older is interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a good run though. Did you? <laughs> yeah, Michael. Why are you looking at me like that? Don't you ever like? Um, Did you? There. That's my. That's my. Uh, my Andy Dick um, impression is. He would say another growling. something. Uh, no, not a growl. Oh no! But he would be like. Oh my God, you're so talented! Don't you wish you had gone further? <laughs> and he's not making a joke. Oh no! And it's like the the worst thing you can say to somebody because I mean, frankly, I'm thrilled. I never thought I you, I can remember you've never thinking, stopped working, Mike. I I can remember thinking if I could just be an extra, or I actually the one thing I remember was uh, the the warm up person for a. A, a sitcom, you yeah. know, they have yeah, yeah, in sitcoms yeah. that during the taping. Was, dollars. Yeah, it was. I remember that. And remember one of my one of my contemporaries then he was older. He was like I don't know thirty, and I was twenty or something. But like he was that, and you know he got to tell jokes. Yeah, and you know got to be involved. He wasn't on the show, but yeah, it my was, buddy tried was, to get me that job. The set. Was, yeah, when I was out of work, my buddy tried to get me that job, and, and I, I remember like, thinking that would be my dream job. Right. You know, I'd never, so I'd never thought I would. To be a warm up guy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was like $1,500 for the week or something. I don't know what I remember, but it was a lot. I was yeah. like, yeah. So, I'm, yeah, I'm grateful for every, I'm, I'm grateful for this podcast. Oh, adorable. <laughs> You're adorable. But, you know, that's the right attitude. You've never stopped working. But I, I get that too. Like, why do you think you didn't make it? Yeah. Well, take it easy, man. Have you seen it? I'm, I'm on the Goldbergs. Relax, man. <laughs> Just sign a fucking another deal. I'm doing all right. Wendy McClendon Covey, another Groundling. Oh, she's so awesome. I yeah. love her. I love Wendy. She's so she's money. By the way, if you guys like comedy, I don't know. I'm going to be at the Comedy Zone in Charlotte, North Carolina, the 20th of July, 21st of July, 22nd of July. Then I'll be heading on to Just for Laughs in Montreal, where I'll be at Cafe Cleopatra doing one hour shows, six of them. All right. That's all I have to say, but only come if you love to fucking laugh. If you can't, if, if you don't like, if you want breaks in the hour, like if you want to be able to catch your breath in the hour, don't come to my show, Mike. Okay. Good don't to know. Come. You know what I'm saying? You should be, I should be in good physical health in order to with, withstand your, I, the comedy cyclone. I have killed cyclone. people with my, they, 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 it's a comedy cyclone. So you're not just a world-class rimmer. No, I'm not. I'm an organic comedian. <laughs> I, I rim afterwards. Hmm, <laughs> gamey. <laughs> My friend who's famous, uh, there was a girl who used to like to do that to him. And What was his name and her name? He, he, well, <laughs> so his last name ends with Cruz. No. Uh, and and uh, he was... Um, he Ted Cruz? He'd been working all Ted Cruz <laughs> and the Republican. Listen, the Republican uh, senator from Texas uh-huh, is, uh-huh. Uh, likes to be rimmed. He likes to be rimmed. Uh, uh, yep, after church. And uh, he... Uh, he was getting he had been working all day and she rimmed him he was like but i got it she goes no you don't and she goes mm gaming <laughs> just end of end of boner end of boner <laughs> end of all boners I end of boner cuz now you got poop poo mouth i can't kiss you and you did it to other guys it's a problem for me yeah so don't say gamey after you 
after you work my rim. <laughs> <laughs> and Dang I won't it. say it to you, <laughs> but I will look you in the eye while I'm doing it, <laughs> which means you'll be on your back. <laughs> what is going on? Why do you? You're do a father, this? right? <laughs> You're pa- a parent. I you have things. Oh, you can't die because you have things to teach your kids. That, that's what you said, right? Yeah. <laughs> Me and Brennan have a have a relationship where Brennan will, if I have a a, a point of view on fighting. Brendan is, is the, my co-host, co-host, the guy who you're who you're doing a fine job replacing. Where where, where he is, is doing what's more important right now? Well, he's covering the Conor McGregor Floyd Mayweather fights for um, Showtime. Showtime. Uh-huh. Yeah, so Brendan is fast becoming a fixture in the MMA scene. <laughs> when I bring up my point of view on MMA to Brendan on this podcast, he is nothing short of belittling, condescending, and borderline disrespectful that's how you have treated me when i brought up rimming it's probably born of your expertise it's exactly right because you don't understand because you go just in one circle because you're an asshole no pun intended (laughs) but i get emails people like like saying things like you need to stand up to brendan your children are going to watch this and they're going to realize that you were spineless and you didn't stand up to him being a bully let me tell you all something right now that's part of our dynamic i I'm never bullied by Brendan. Nobody bullies me. I know who I am. He's my little brother. And I enjoy that. We like to do this kind of thing. So please, thank you for your concern. But it got me thinking, what are my kids going to watch? What are they going to see that I'm ashamed of? I've done so many podcasts and told, been so honest and told such outrageous stories on the Rogan podcast and stuff. Like about orgies and stuff. And it's the, gonna be bad. The thing about podcasts too is you forget it's very easy to forget mm-hmm. that um anyone is <laughs> watching or listening or anything like that because you know, like I don't know if you were on uh the late show or something, there's cameras all around and it's you're it's pretty uh, yeah, easy it's to realize energy. like, oh, I will be careful. Yeah. Um but on a on something like this, and especially if you know people really well, and you suddenly realize like you've and I, I killed a man when I was 12. Yeah. When I was 12. <laughs> Let's go to some current events. I just sure. realized we have to do that. Oh, yeah. You guys are talking about mixed Mikey martial did. arts, too, and Showtime. Uh, do you watch mixed martial arts at all, Michael? Um, by the expression, I'm going to do it for the audience so they can see what you <laughs> did um, to me, and then I'll translate <laughs> what it was. Do you uh, watch <laughs> mixed martial arts, Michael? <laughs> I did. <laughs> um <laughs> That's, That's so funny. Uh, yeah. Judging Michael. Yeah. Um, I'll take my cock and balls back whenever you want to give them to me. <laughs> Let me know when you're done. Um, I don't necessarily watch a lot of uh, fights. Yeah. Uh, it it bums me out. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, you haven't been... You don't have somebody like me to help you navigate it. I want you to come to my house. You drink a warm glass of milk. You sit on my lap. <laughs> We're not going to wear pants, and I'm going to bring you through what's going on. But I will do this. I, ha- I whenever I find out there's one where like somebody's arm breaks, or mm. le- like um, you know, I've seen one where I think a guy gets kicked right in the, the shin. That was Anderson and, Silva, yeah. Uh, uh, then I can't stop watching that. Yeah. <laughs> You're either one extreme or the other. I guess so. Bring up what this. Uh... All right. So Ariel Hawani, who's like one of the biggest reporters for MMA, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, he was supposed to do that thing with Brendan too. It was supposed to be him, Brendan, Polly Malinaji, yep, and then uh, Ariel and Moro Ronaldo, Moro Ronaldo too. So he was supposed to be a part of it, and then last minute he flew there and everything. Last second, uh, they Showtime told him that Dana White or the UFC specifically asked that he's not on the show anymore. So he's They've not on They've always had a anymore. contentious relationship with him. They just yeah. don't like him. And they waited to the last, the last minute of that huge, the very first press conference they had for the fight. It's interesting, Ariel. I feel like it's almost good for Ariel because we're talking about it. Oh yeah, he's always there, and he and he's always doing his job, and he's a good journalist. The best, you know, he really is. Um, he's just sensitive, and he's probably like, you know, he's he's. I don't know. I think I think maybe he asks hard questions, and you know, he he. He's got that little twinkle in his eye, and it bothers people sometimes. <laughs> he bugs twinkle. the shit out of fighters. Some fighters he does. hate him. He absolutely but, does. But you know, do he's that. also asking real questions and hard questions. And yeah. I, I don't, I've ne- I don't know enough, but I, I've never seen him be that unfair. No, I, I agree. <laughs> I knew it, Michael. <laughs> 
by the way, like when I um, I, when you do press, you know, like if you yeah. go to Charlotte or whatever, sometimes they they would have you. You're going to do the country music station at six in the morning, then at seven. It's uh, all talk sports, whatever. Right. And uh, they this were these were these guys that were all they did on their sports show was like get so into the weeds. You know, well, let's remember back in '94 when he was batting at seven thirty. Blah blah. blah you know, like yeah. and they're just they're going into it and they go. Oh, by the way, do you uh, do you follow professional baseball or whatever? It was definitely a sport I didn't follow. I said, it doesn't matter to me. I promise you I will be able to stay engaged in the conversation no matter what. <laughs> and that they would be they would then like say you, to me like professional. They, they would be like, Well, so what do you who do you think is gonna gonna win? Is it gonna be the the Red Sox or the White Sox? And I'd be like, It's gonna be one or the other, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> and like they they didn't Excellent even understand answer. I was completely just yeah. bullshit. Definitely be one. It depends. It depends on it de- honestly you, it depends on I think the better team's gonna win. Uh, <laughs> Whoever gets the ball over the fence more. Yeah. Well, what at the end of the day, you look at the score, the one with the bigger number, they're taking home the prize. <laughs> the prize. <laughs> can, they're taking home the prize. They're taking home the ribbon. You can really, uh, you can really bullshit your way through anything. Yes, you can. The baseball team is going to take home the ribbon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what's the next one? All right, this one. This lady. No way. She got sentenced for flight groping. She licked another. Uh, so she's a she's like a twenty seven year old woman. She's hot. She's pretty yeah, hot. You can pretty. see her picture right here too. Oh, it's gone now. There, oh, there she is. is. Wow. She's fucking beautiful. Yeah. Jesus. There's a nineteen year old girl sitting next to her, and then she would lick her ear and try to make out with her, force her to drink alcohol, and touch the inner her inner thigh. And well, I and didn't I, didn't know each other. Didn't know each other. I 100% approve, <laughs> and uh, I think she's delicious. And so she looks pretty hot. Yeah, I don't think she should be persecuted. I want to. You know what? <laughs> there you go. I approve. Wait, where were, where was she flying from and to? Sometimes that's <laughs> she might have been. Thing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Like, is Florida involved? She, she might have been just very drunk. And that's what I'm thinking. If she was like on some kind of uh, horny pill. No, well, no, this guilty. is an example of that can ruin you because now she's 19. She did she's some 27. stuff. Oh, she's 27. Yeah. So she does some stuff. I don't know what happened here. It says pleaded guilty to assault with the intent to commit a felony. That's pretty heavy. So she's she wow. knew what she was doing, most likely. I I, I don't know. You know. It's, well, how? Let's see the picture of the victim. Was, well, I don't think they'll show that either. She's so hot, though. Look at her. I know this she, this one right here is. She's, she's probably yeah. She's probably she's probably used to getting um Girls. getting a yes. <laughs> I was gonna say no shit. I'd love to dress up in lipstick and a wig and have her do that to my crotch um, and lick my ear. You know what I'm saying? It's not cheating if you're dressed like a woman when you do it. Uh, what? Anyway, bravo, and I think that's a little excessive, and give me a fucking break. Next. All right. This is a very heartwarming story. No pun intended. So a, a bride-to-be, her groom secretly flew in a guy who – took her son's heart after the son passed away oh, and wow. donated his heart. And then, uh, so he surprised her at the wedding and they brought a stethoscope so she could hear the heart beating. Oh, come Dude, on. How crazy is that? Yeah. That makes me want to cry, bro. Come on. Uh, Jesus. Yeah, that was very That's the, story. wait, that's, it was her son? Her son that passed away. She doesn't look very old. Oh, he was, nine, he was like 19, and it was uh, two years ago, and this is the person that received the heart. And, and where, what was the thing? It was a wedding? Or is that her, wedding, her yeah. wedding? So I'm not sure what happened with as far as a wedding beforehand. That's an amazing wedding, but... gift, dude. That's crazy. That, yeah. I, I swear to God, that should be a poster or something. Yeah, that's her being surprised when he came. What a good dude he is. What a good guy that groom is, man. What a yeah, perfect, yeah. yeah. What a perfect thing. Oh my god, dude, that, that groom is awesome. Mm. That makes me want to cry. That's that's a beautiful story. Mm-hmm. Mm. I'm very sensitive. I'm embarrassed right now. I got a little emotional. All right, take it off. Don't right, do well with check crying. this out. In China, they have a facial recognition machine for toilet paper because so many people are stealing the toilet paper there. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? I, so I want to. I have so many racist jokes. <laughs> do it. No, I can't. Come on, Mike. <laughs> I can't. If, if Bobby Lee was here, who is not Chinese, I know he is Korean. Same thing, but bro. He would. He would egg me on. Yeah, he would. He really would. Um, Bobby. I love Bobby. <laughs> I get him back on. I miss him. In fact, I got to get him. Did you know Bobby? Yeah, I'm I love sure Bobby. 
He's a he's a funny one. So wait, what, <laughs> let's get into it. Sorry, <laughs> I was going down a racist so wormhole. St- so do. facial recognition <laughs> because people steal toilet paper. T- from it seems like a out. really big investment for. I mean, okay, let's say people are stealing toilet paper. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not expensive. No. How much toilet paper is being stolen in order to make that investment pay off? I want to know. I think people are poor and they're like, you know what? I can save money. Let's take the toilet paper. It probably happens the minute they put it in there. Bandits. Fucking Chinese bandits. Please. Like So then, so you take a shit in public. Mm-hmm. Um, your asshole's dirty. Yeah. You can't wipe yet. You you've, no got to, you've got to stand up. You have no one to go, and mm, you've got gamey. A, you've, got, <laughs> you've got no a world-class class. rimmer. We have no world-class um, rimmer. You've got to walk, it, what it seems like, uh, stand up and walk maybe point, across too. the bathroom and then hope you look like you that day, and then get as much toilet paper as they allow. That's kind of crazy, right? That is a... I mean, I already can barely ever take a shit. I'm just, in general, like, I don't, I sort of don't need to, ever, but especially in public. Your body uses everything you eat. (laughs) Yeah, I'm I'm so greedy. No, no, I understand. Um, But that could only make going poo in public that much more anxiety- uh, cause yeah that's weird because now there's a shit bank you know face, face. <laughs> and yeah there's your digital your digital memory thing they, like they you just see that dna it goes into a fucking into a tube <laughs> he's All not right. smiling no, no he's not although they have a picture of him there it he gives you two feet of toilet paper two feet oh uh, yeah yeah two feet of mm-hmm. toilet paper every nine minutes with the same face <laughs> uh, <laughs> the details are what really make that holy shit same. every nine minutes by every that time minutes. <laughs> two feet i think i might need more depending all right all right nothing gamey girl can't out. fix more jokes how about this uh in florida a family was getting caught up in a riptide rip yeah. curl so all the beachgoers like 80 plus beachgoers formed a human chain to wow. save them, to I, kill saw, them I, I saw this wow i knew this that's badass saved everyone Save yeah. everybody. Save and and um, one of the family members was a, a, like the matriarch of it had a heart attack on the beach oh, or in the, in the van on the way back. But they Save they it. survived her. Wow. Or, yeah, you know, uh, if you get caught in Riptide, let it take you and swim uh, along the beach if everybody wants to know. Uh, surfers use it to their advantage. But when you fight it, oof. in Biarritz in south of France where I summer sometimes because I, I make a fortune. Uh, <laughs> actually, my friend does. Um you, yeah, I was going to say people you, get die like twice, two, three, four, five people a, a year. They just get drunk, and they just the, the sea just takes you. If she takes, I've you. I've have um a little bit of an obsession with being lost at sea. Like, it, did you ever see that movie Open Water? I sure did. It's terrifying. That was was that not? No, no. no listen, if you want to, if you want me to cry like a bitch, like a baby. We talk, this is what we talk about, you know, human, you know, well, he's brave. What do you mean brave? Brave when? Brave when he knows how to navigate that situation, when he knows how to run a punt back, when he knows how to deal with the octagon. We take you, we drop you in the middle of the ocean right before it gets dark. Yeah. And we're going to take off. We'll see you later. <laughs> it's 20 miles back to, 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 to shore. Enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Horrifying. Yeah, no, no. Because you don't know what's under you. Right. That's why I don't even really love swimming in lakes. Uh-uh. It's, and it's it's a, it's a real weird thing, and I'm a like great swimmer. I, you know, was a, a swimming teacher. Like I can, I can swim forever. You taught improv and swimming, huh? I did. I taught swimming when I was in high school with Gwen Stefani. Get weird? the fuck out of here! Yeah. You did, yeah, with Gwen. Yeah. What was she like? Awesome. She was awesome. She was um like. I think I'm about four years older than her, but like I was, I think I was in college, you know, it was a summer job and we taught um, in Anaheim and uh, she was this little, you know, she kind of had the little Madonna she sort short? of cut. She's mm, five, seven. Yeah. Something like that. I don't know. But she was, um, she was absolutely adorable, sweet <sighs> and kind. And her. she like, we always gave her all the kids who cried cause she was able to, Aww. to completely um, make them feel better. What a woman. And uh, and on top of it, then like we would go out and like get beers afterwards typically, you know, and um, like go buy a 12 pack and then sit behind, you know, the the backstop of the high school where we taught swimming. It was dumb ah. teenage stuff. But we would say to Gwen, like, do you want to come come with us? We're going to have beers. And she'd be like, mm, I'm going to go practice with my brother's band. And we'd wow. be like, well, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that, Gwen Stefani. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then her, didn't her Gavin, that guy, cheat on her? I don't know. I'm guessing. He didn't. Has he done anything besides glycerin? I don't know. Glycerin. I don't know. Rain, rain, rain. I don't know his, he has that one word. song that Bush, I know. right? Yeah, that was Bush. Glycerin. Good looking guy. Mm-hmm. But I don't care. All right, whatever. <laughs> whatever, Gav. All right, I got one last one. This is making headlines now because a guy, a KKK guy, was caught wearing dreadlocks. And it's like all over the uh, black Twitter and it's going viral right now. A and you guys are so excited. Locks showed up at KKK rally because hate doesn't make sense. Mm. One race should not have the exclusive right to wear dreadlocks. Also, until I read this article, I did not know there was a black Twitter. <laughs> that was just a I comment, guess white too. people are not welcome. You there. know, my, my thought on that is I don't like it really when any white person has dreadlocks. <laughs> That's why I brought this up. I always think it's bullshit. I, I always They're do. appropriating something? No, it's not that. I just think, oh, really? Did you need to? Because you yeah. know how hard they have to work to dreadlock their hair. You know, like it's, it's somebody with normally work. straight hair and yeah. they're, they're, they're doing everything to it. I'm just like, oh. Yeah, I don't think you can Is wash it, it forever. It feels to me like there's just so much effort that um, whenever I see somebody putting that much effort into something, I, I just kind of, it's an eye roll to me. Yeah, I would agree with you. There's a lot of accoutrement. So he's a Klansman. He's wearing mm-hmm. black. It's interesting with the cross. I guess there's different there's different uh, uniforms now mm-hmm. for the Klan, huh? Yeah, there, there's a now they're more just pro white. Is that the idea? This We're is not anti black. KKK We're rally. Yeah, it's like we we just are pro white. Right, I guys. wonder. I wonder how big of a deal the Klan is. Like, is it? Does anyone know like how I, I how prevalent it think is? So, I mean, I've, I've never. <laughs> I mean, never I, met somebody in the clan, but yeah, um, I might be related to some, but no. I, yeah, I don't. I don't think, um, frankly, that they are going to take over the world anytime soon. <laughs> They're kind of. Where are they? Where is that? Probably somewhere. Some I'm small guess Alabama. town in. It could be Florida, rural somewhere. Charlottesville. North Carolina, right? Well, that's where I'm or going. Or Virginia. What am I saying? Oh, yeah. Charlotte. My, oh, my parents used to Virginia. live in Virginia. Charlottesville. Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> I know. I'm mixing up everything. There you way to work up. it in. Are they in, are they in, are they in Charlotte, North Carolina? Are they anywhere com- near the near Zanies? Near the Comedy Zone? <laughs> near the Comedy Zone, uh, July 20th, 21st, 22nd, when I'm doing stand-up? Because if they are, I'm going to freak out. <laughs> uh, I will, I will destroy them with wit and humor. <laughs> Show us the next thing. That was it. <laughs> Amazing. Slow news day. Slow news day. I usually have a segment called Dropping Knowledge. You, what percentage of Americans say they've seen a ghost? I'm going to say 60%. Chin? I would say 90. The answer is 17%. Oh, wow. <laughs> according to one stat. <laughs> according to a made up place <laughs> that I. According to what goes on in my brain. (laughs) In order to win bar bets. Yes. Yes. (laughs) And how do you prove that they haven't seen a ghost? Have you ever seen a ghost? I sure haven't. Don't believe in them. Although the Bible and lots of different religious scripture always gives quarter to ghosts. Have you ever uh, lost somebody that you were close to who has visited you in a dream? No. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) Or, I mean, that you've dreamt about them also. You can characterize it either way. Yeah, but I would call that a dream. But yeah, I have. You know, I mean, um, I is there anybody close to you? Dreams are a mystery, aren't they? Yeah. Have Have you ever anybody close to you that you've lost? Do you ever uh, talk to them after they've passed? No, no. I honestly can't can't say that that's the case. Yeah. You? You? I, I guess you just end on bad terms with everyone. I do. I'm not talking to you when anymore. they die. Ever? It's their fault for being weak. You know what I mean? <laughs> for leaving you? Yeah, and also for being weak. You know, <laughs> don't die. You know. Uh, how, how about you? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Have you Mom. seen a ghost? I don't know because I was so uh, bereaved by uh, one thing in particular that. I don't think I was in my friend right or mind. family member. Friend. Oh man. Yeah. How old? 
Uh, he, he was 49. Mm, this is recently? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. That sucks. Did he, they die? He took his life. Oh, fuck. That's, oh, was it Chris Cornell? No, oh. no. This is my best friend growing up. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was God. awful. Yeah, that's a... That, we were talking a little bit about that, like where people take their own life and you didn't, you never know it, or or at least it's just so incomprehensible. You can't figure out what level of despair they were going through, you know? Yeah, it's the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Did you see it coming? Did, did he have a history of... I spoke with him four days before. Huh. And... I can't believe I'm talking about this. It's all right. You don't have to, but you know, I think it helps other people. Right. The, the reason I think it's important to talk about stuff like this sometimes is a lot of people are listening, and I get emails. People, there are a lot of people that feel this way, that feel like they maybe want to. Right. Right. And I think it helps them navigate shit, especially because you and I are older and we've lived a life. Right. And maybe, maybe, maybe you can give them some perspective, you know. And sometimes there are no answers, but I don't know. I always feel like there's something to be gained. Yeah. You know? Uh, well, first of all, it's the worst. Yeah. It's the worst. Yeah. Um, I found him. You found oh, him. Gosh. And I did not see it coming. I've spoken with him days before. We, we were at, he was, mm, it was the Oscars. Really? And, uh, I was throwing, uh, an Oscar party and he, you know, I did it every year. It was a small, small group and, you know, pizza and talk shit and, you know, root and cheer for people. And, uh, like I said, I'd known him forever and, uh, he lived down the street and, um, people started coming to the party and I, I just, I texted him a couple of times, like, you know, just, I haven't heard from you, you know, are you, are you definitely coming or not? You know, he would normally have been there like an hour early. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I, I could have walked to the house, but I just drove, mm. um, because I was worried and, uh, found him. God damn. That's the worst thing in the world, man. Yeah. Dude, that's the craziest thing in the world, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And what it uh, does is it makes you, uh, the, the people that you leave behind, uh, it, it makes them uh, qu- question and doubt. Um, like what? Everything, you know, you... Life or what they could have done, what they differently, what they could have done. How if the, if only they had seen. It makes you you replay the tape. Mm. Um, like we went we went hiking in Runyon Canyon because mm. I live right near there, and we we would hike all the time. That was one of them. I mean, we traveled the world together. We every Christmas we cook, you know, together. I knew him since I was fourteen. He was really like my brother. And um, how long ago is this, Mike? Uh, it was two, two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. Um, but it makes you, um, replay everything in your mind, you know, like what, oh, did he, when, when he said this, did that mean this, you know, Mm -hmm. you, you, uh, but you'll make yourself crazy that way. Right. Because, because, because even if you know somebody, I feel like we don't know anybody but ourselves. Like, I really feel that way. Like I, I didn't see, I didn't, I thought, I thought, uh, I thought I knew, you know, mm-hmm. it was, that was, uh, I guess I'll call it the, a lesson from it was you don't know what you think you know. <laughs> and um, that's what you mean by question everything, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and blame myself for, I mean, I still do to a degree, but like you question whether you're any good as a friend, if you are, um, affects the people around you so um indelibly and mm-hmm. um and the aftermath of it is is horrific yeah um you know there's there's a lot of uh 
logistics to death in general, but for something like that, um, it's it's even worse, mm-hmm. you know. And having to tell the family, you had to. Well, I didn't want the police to. Oh, my God. You know, that's the choice. My God. So, how do you do that? How the fuck do you do that? I've always wondered about that. Like doctors who come out. I, you know, it's. I mean, you're uh, not prepared for that. There's no, no way to prepare for. No, that. no. There's no script for that. Shit. No, no. Uh, I, I actually, I actually called. Uh, I had to get on in his phone to, uh, even though I know his family mm. um, from childhood. Uh, I didn't have their number, so the only way I could get their number was from his phone. And um, I didn't want to call the parents because um, I felt like... They needed it, a buffer. They needed yeah, I felt, I felt like they deserved to hear about it from one of their own. Like, that makes sense. I just, I don't know, it was like a respect thing, I guess. That makes total sense. So I called his brother, and I wasn't thinking... I mean, I, I didn't... In it's, shock. You're... Yeah, and uh, it was a blur, um, and so I called his brother from his phone, and his brother said, hey, man, uh, thinking it was my friend. I don't, don't want to say his name, but yeah. – um, and I said, oh, it's it's not him. It's it's Mike, and this is a guy I've known my whole life, but I, I don't talk to him, yeah. you know, um, and I could hear – I said, it sounds like you're in the car. And uh, he said, yeah, I am. Um, what's going on? And I said, well, I, I, I have to you know, tell you something, but I think you should pull over. Yeah. And he said, well, I'm on the 405 right down by Camp Pendleton, and there, there's no um, off-ramps. They're like every three or four miles. And so he said it's three miles to the off-ramp. Um, and I said, that's okay. I'll just ride with you until you can pull over. And he knew at this point something was up. Well, he, you know, he said, I'm, I'm getting nervous. And, uh, I said, well, you know, we don't have to talk, you know, just, just when you're get to a spot to pull over, pull over. And, um, and that three miles is about three minutes. Yeah, it's about three years. And it, and it, yeah, it, I mean, so I, I told him and, um, it, to, to have that, um, knowledge mm. that what you're about to say to somebody is going to, uh, break their heart. Yeah. Uh, is the hardest thing e- ever. Yeah. It's amazing that two years later, it's so hard for you to talk about, too. Yeah, it's, uh, sorry, I can't believe I'm doing I, this I appreciate the... it, man. I can't believe, you, did you think you were going to come on the fire and kid and talk about no, this? No, I didn't, I didn't. Well, well I, I appreciate didn't. it, man. I mean, I think it's really important to help, because it helps people, you know? Do you yeah. know what to do with that grief? Uh, I lost two years, I'd say, in in some respects, you know? You lost just, two years. Yeah, I just, uh... Like it, some, it messes with you. It messes with your. Um, it messed with my confidence. Is really it did? I, yeah. I would say that. Like, what do you mean? Uh, like, I just I didn't think I. Uh, uh, what I knew, I, I felt like I didn't know what was real. You know what? If I if I didn't see mm-hmm. that, if I couldn't see that um, coming, um, then I don't. You know, my eyes have not opened. Like, so it, it makes you question. Uh, lots of things, and um, uh, it's it's a terrible. He can I I'm on, my only hope and wish is that he knows how uh, loved he was. Yeah, I I don't know what it's like, obviously, to be in that mindset. None of us do until we do it. But I I think that that level of despair or that sort of decision that there's no way out of this and this is the best and the easiest way, I don't think has anything to do with anybody but themselves. And that, and that's you know? a, a totally, uh, sorry, you know, that's another thing. Like I, 
I think you also then feel like, well, wait, this isn't about you. You're, you know, it's. It uh, is though, isn't it? I mean, it's, you can say that the problem with this is that you can intellectualize, but sometimes like um, Hicks and Gracie was talking about when he lost his son and he's a warrior. He's a, he's a, one of the great jujitsu fighter, MMA fighters, you know, pioneer. And, mm -hmm. and he's a God among the MMA community and jujitsu community. And, and he was a yogi and all that stuff. And, and he said he finally had to realize that he hit rock bottom. Like he, he, he realized that <clears throat> sometimes there's no answer and there's no way out of the grief and mm -hmm. it just brought him to his fucking knees. Mm -hmm. And there are things in life like this that did this to you that bring you to your knees. Yeah. And, 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 uh, I, I'm, and, and I think that sometimes all you can do as I get older is there's no answer. There's nothing I can say. There's nothing a priest can say or anybody else. Sometimes you just got to feel bad. Mm -hmm. You got to surrender to it. Yeah. You got to realize that there are no answers and that you did lose confidence and that you are changed from it. And ultimately it's okay because, you know, we're made of flesh and blood, man. Yeah. We're so vulnerable, aren't we? We're so, the, the other thing is so hard is when you have children or you're just a human being, you, you build this life for yourself and you realize it can be taken away this quickly, yeah. right? We're flesh and blood, and and so not only just physically, but emotionally, we're so fragile. Yeah. Look, look at this, like you know, your 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 brother for all intents and purposes. Well, how about this? So uh, we there, and then life turns things around in a weird way. So we cooked Thanksgiving dinner together every year, and uh, the Ferguson riots happened later that year. It was like around. Um, November. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was, I had spent uh, by that point about six months just bawling my eyes out. And I mean, I bursting into tears at dry cleaners at, uh, you name it, like mm -hmm. all, I, I was not in control at all. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't, I just had crying jags. And, uh, so I was driving to the store to buy the Thanksgiving turkey. Mm -hmm. And this was the first Thanksgiving I was going to be cooking on my own. And um, I remember being so depressed. And so I turned on talk radio and all of talk. <laughs> when you're depressed, what do you do? Turn on talk radio. But I just needed something to get my mind off of it. It was all this shit about the Ferguson riots and, and racial unrest. And racial unrest really, it really bums me out more even. Yeah. So I go into the line at the supermarket and I'd already ordered my turkey. It was like one of those frou-frou um, things. Or in Hollywood. turkey. Yeah. Pasture raised. And um, there was a woman right in front of me. And she was a little black, very old black lady. And she was ordering her turkey. And it was so big that, like, it was as big as her practically. Like, the guy had to carry it out and put it, put it in her cart. And she goes, you know, thank you very much. She goes around to, good, to the check. That's, that's my old black lady voice. voice. Well, you're going to hear more of it. Okay. So I get up to the – I'm next. And the guy says, you know, what, what can I get for you? I'm like, a turkey. And he says, okay, for how many people? And I go, ten and then I remembered my friend was not going to be there. I go, I mean, nine and and just I right mean, there, right there. And that's it happened all the time. And that, that was it. Just the wow. reminder that I'm not cooking for 10. There's one less person at the table. And so he gave me I mean, he literally walked the turkey out just like he did for the old black lady because I was so upset that I, I was amazing. my hands were shaking. I get in line. I'm right behind the little black lady and she's pushing her she pushes out like right in front of me and the parking lot it's the whole it's the bristol farms on sunset yeah. and fairfax it's got like a a slight little thing to it so um she's pushing and i can see her fighting to keep the cart you know going and i, I was in my grief and, and i was thinking like maybe i can turn this into a positive what could i do what could i do i can help this little black lady with her big turkey yeah. so i i get to the she got to her car and i i was like she can't lift it out and put it in the car so i i caught up to her and uh, i said excuse me ma'am would you like some help uh, with your turkey and she said oh no that's all right i don't need help and i had taken my hands off and i said no really i'd i'd like to help and in that moment in it's almost like in slow motion my cart just starts to drift and it and it's got a big, heavy turkey and bunches of tons of wine. Like it's heavy. It's, it's so it, like, fucking heavy. And it fucking it clips her cart. Oh shit! 
and her cart then just pushes. It's not it's not whizzing, but it just pushes, and the corner of the metal cart just grazes her car door, and she p- puts like a good fourteen inch scratch in her car. And I literally I look at her, and I and I just. <laughs> burst into tears like, oh, I'm so sorry I was, I was trying to help my friend I lost my friend <laughs> I'm just volunteering and blubbering all of this I at her and I'll, be, I'll, worth I'll, damn. I'll fix your car my friend died <laughs> and, she, and she was so sweet she, she put her hands on my shoulder and she said sweetheart things is just things now you have a good Thanksgiving and don't you worry about it. And I'll say, oh, okay, thanks. Are you sure? Thank you. And I go push my my Thanksgiving turkey over to my car, still crying. And I'm thinking, you know, like my heart is sort of warm with human spirit. And, yeah. you know, this woman who had the grace. Things is just things. Things is just things. And then <laughs> as I was, you know, getting into my car, I hear her. I didn't see there was an old black man in the passenger seat waiting for her she goes did you see what that white boy did in my car <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh fuck and oh I mean, my god oh my god that's that oh, weirdly so that funny. horrible horrible event led to so many crazy experiences and i guess it's just you sort of realize the fullness of this has been one world. of my favorite podcasts i've ever done that's a good one. i'm not kidding that was a really amazing story. Thanks for sharing that because I think that helped people because I, I'm sure I, there are a lot of people who, who are going through what you're going through. They don't know how to put it into context. Talk to somebody. And also, if you, if you suspect um, somebody of being in that place, don't be afraid or embarrassed to bring up the subject. Mm. Talk to them. Mm. Well, dude, thanks, man. I think those are very important words. This has been a fucking great sorry. podcast. We went. So don't be sorry. Are you kidding? We went from rimming <laughs> to one of the more one of the more powerful kind of stories. Um, and I think that's what I love about doing shit like this. That's why I don't want to plan anything with you. Not because I thought you'd tell the story, but just because <laughs> you know, I, it, it's just great to kind of discover this stuff. There's yeah. nothing you you're know. good you're good to um you're m- much better um uh host than i thought you would be well i appreciate that because <laughs> every time i see you i'm on and we're fucking joking around that was the thing i, I texted you yeah, you don't have to be on all the time because uh, if you, if i run into you in a like oh, a it's, it's, um whatever it's play time yeah and you're yeah. just on yeah. on on and uh it well, always because, makes me laugh yeah it's always fun but man then you get into what counts and what matters and and that's a that's an amazing powerful story so god damn that's a this is one of my favorite podcasts mike mcdonald thank you thank you for having low expectations to begin with (laughs) it always helps it always helps now you're you're always a killer i've always been an admirer i've always been a fan and uh it doesn't surprise me and i'm i'm so sorry about your grief but i'm really glad you shared it because i think it's going to help people through it i hope it does i hope it does it's the only reason to talk about it yeah yeah Mm -hmm. you know and it means something and and your suffering matters ladies and gentlemen um i appreciate you guys listening um i've already plugged my dates i'm not going to do it again (laughs) but god bless you mike mcdonald you are welcome back any fucking time and uh this has been the fighter and the kid we're out (laughs) 